Welcome, everyone. Uh, for those who are standing, there are a few seats up here if you'd like to take them. It's always interesting that nobody wants to sit in the front, including us. Uh, please join me. Uh, welcome to the Take Elizabeth Town Council uh, September 14th, 2015 meeting. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Could we get the roll call by the town clerk? Chairman Ray? Here. Councilor Grennan? Here. Councilor Jordan? Here. Councilor McCausland? Here. Councilor Sullivan? Here. Councilor Wagner? Present. And Councilor Walsh? Here. Thank you very much, Deborah. Um, I would like to move on to town council reports and correspondence. Um, Molly, did you want to talk about Thursday? I just wanted to ri remind everyone that um, we had a couple of council goals this year um, that included uh, developing a more formal mechanism for citizens to contribute to the annual goal setting process in the community and also to look at some additional opportunities for citizen engagement in the process and in response to those goals we've set up a roundtable discussion for Thursday night this week, that's the 17th. We'll be meeting at 7 p.m. in the middle school cafetorium. We'll look forward to seeing all of you there. Um, I'm anticipating it'll be about an hour to an hour and a half, probably not any longer than that, but we would really value your input. We hope you'll come. Thanks. Thank you, Molly. Are there any other counselors that have any uh, committee reports that they'd like to talk about? No. Okay, seeing none, then um, I will move on to the Finance Committee report. Um, and you should have all received your dashboard uh, link. Uh, Jim? Well, uh, now that the uh, new year has got a uh, little time under its belt, we do have some results, obviously, year to date. Um, and again, the dashboard is on the website for those of you in the community. This is something new for the Town Council, to have a one or two page dashboard that sort of gives us a bit of a uh, check on where we are in relationship to the budget assumptions we made and uh, you know again excise tax continues to be positive with all the new vehicles being purchased as well as new homes and two new neighborhoods so people are registering their cars here in Cape Elizabeth. Gift shop sales are up as you've been seeing the uh, cruise ships come to town. Uh, we'd love to see one per day uh, all summer long because it's good business for our gift shop. And of course, we fund a lot of the, uh, the infrastructure improvements in the park from the monies that we make at, that, uh, at the museum store. Uh, under the expenditure side, uh, just point out that we had uh, an additional uh, $20,000 worth of overtime for the Public Works Department. And this was directly related to uh, what I would consider an unplanned tall ships visit. Uh, which uh, did incur quite, a, quite an expense in terms of being able to manage the park and manage the, the traffic. And secondly, the anniversary concert celebrating the 250th anniversary of Cape Elizabeth. Other than that, it's very straightforward. And if there are any comments or any suggestions, again, this is a work in progress. And um, I think it's a, you know, it's a wonderful tool for at least the town council to have a handle on exactly what's taking place, but also for the community to look instead of reading the 27 pages of uh, basically an eye exam uh, to try to determine what the financial health of the community is at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Does any <clears throat> counselor have any questions for Jim? Molly? Uh, comment and a question. I love the new document. Thank you. Works really well. And I had a question, and I'm not sure if it's for you or for the manager, but I see a blank where it says cable franchise fee. Is that because they pay, I don't know what, in Once arrears? a year. Comes later. Once a year. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Okay. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, so now we move on to a citizen opportunity for discussion of items not on the agenda. I'm assuming most people are here about items that are on the agenda, but if there's anyone who has anything to say about something not on the agenda, please come up to the podium and tell us your name, address, and you have three minutes. I'm not seeing anybody stand up. All right, then we will move on um, to the town manager's monthly report. Michael? 
Yeah, uh, thanks, Kathy. I'll put something in writing, and the only thing I wanted to mention is there are a couple chairs here on the aisle if anyone would like to, to take them. And whenever we get a crowd, I like to remind everyone where the exits are. There's, there's one out this way. Uh, the ramp, that's, although it's not well signed, you can actually go out through that door and go out the front door. Don't go out that door, but you can go out that one. The, the, the one that leads to the men's and ladies' rooms doesn't lead to the outside, so don't go that way. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, then we will move on to the review of the draft minutes for the August 10th, 2015 meeting. Is there a motion to approve? Jessica. I so move. Thank you. Is there a second? Seconded. Thank you, Jim. Questions? <coughs> Comments? <coughs> Arrows, omissions? No. All in favor? Thank you very much. So now we're going to move on to the public hearing uh, for the license for the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club. Um, again, this is a chance for people to speak. Um, this is an open-ended um, public hearing, so we will listen to as many people who want to speak um, to speak. You have three minutes. Um, please come up to the podium, state your name and your address. Um, it's helpful if there's going to be multiple people that you sort of form a line so that there's not a, you know, a, a time in between. Um, and I have um, on my phone a timer, so I will just ask you that if my timer goes off, please uh, finish up and, and let the next person speak. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tammy Walter. Um, I live at 1095 Sawyer Road in Cape Elizabeth. I'm the president of the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club. With exception of the overhead baffles, we have complied with everything the Georgia evaluator, Rick LaRosa, mentioned in his safety report. What we have started building in the last couple of weeks at the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club, the R Design Works Rick LaRosa overhead baffles is beyond what anyone else in Maine has for an outdoor shooting range shot containment. This far exceeds anything that any of our peers have had to install for safety. One third of our membership lives in the town of Cape Elizabeth. We are important to this community. We are an important part of the history of this town. The limbo that our club is currently in needs to be resolved. After nearly three years of this situation, we are looking to you to end this tonight by approving our license. My main reason for joining the gun club and accepting the position as president was because I saw that one small group of people was trying to force their will on the entire town. They have one goal. They don't want a gun club to exist in their backyard. That is not fair. They interfered with our grant process and made it harder for us to improve safety at the club. We have bent over backwards to try to accommodate them. Our efforts to improve safety have gotten us nowhere except shut down. This is not about safety or noise. They want us gone. We ask that you grant us our license tonight because it's the fair and right thing to do. Thank you all. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Mark Neal, House President, Spurbank Brown and Gun Club. <coughs> Um, the literal, literal interpretation of provisions of the ordinance has deprived the club of its right to operate all portions of its existing shooting facility. The hardship exemption that I'm going to request and conditioned by the club will be only affect the use of a short distance range and will therefore not materially affect the safety of the surrounding neighborhoods or the general public welfare. And the exception only permits the use of the short distance to the five yard shooting range and is therefore the minimum needed to allow the continued use of the club shooting range. Subject to code enforcement's inspection and determination that the club perimeter has been properly secured and that Ms. LaRosa's certification that the club range manual has been updated as suggested, Club respectfully requests the issuance of a conditional license that includes the ability to open the 25-yard range on the club's premises based on the so-called hardship exemption provision in the shooting range ordinance. The terms of such conditional license, the use of the 50 and 100-yard ranges would remain suspended until demonstrated compliance with Ms. LaRosa's range design. If the town council finds itself unable to grant the requested hardship exemption 
conditional approval allowing the use of the 25-yard range. The club asks that the town council grant the club's license subject to the satisfaction <coughs> excuse me subject to the satisfaction by the club of the clear and well-documented requirements stated in Mr. LaRosa's report and further find that the club's 50 and 100 yard ranges may be reopened in a phased manner upon determination by the town code enforcement officer that the requirements for each range have been met. <coughs> The hardships that have resulted from closing our club you have to excuse me is an extremely emotional point that we're dealing with here. I am absolutely positive that we'll have some resolution, good or bad, tonight. I would like to thank very much the members of our club who have put out so much effort and time towards helping our club survive. I am completely disgusted with the actions of our neighbors towards our club members, towards members of this, officials of this town and employees of this town. You should be ashamed of yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kathleen Kent. I'm a resident of 74 Wells Road in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I've been living out of town for the last four years, so hopefully I'm not rehashing too much material. But we moved to Wells Road in 1992, I believe. The gun club was there. We knew it was there, and we chose to live there anyways because we so enjoyed and so valued the rural character, the scenic beauty, and the open spaces of that part of Cape Elizabeth. That part of Cape Elizabeth has been changed forever by development. And unfortunately, that can't go back. But it seems to me that the town should have some protections for the people and the activities that pre-existed before the development. And I still do not understand why people choose to live next to a gun club and then want to shut it down. It was there. They knew it was there. They had a choice. Now they expect others to live with the consequence of their choice. If that turns out to be the decision of the town, I think it only fair that those residents that are causing this to happen also foot the bill of what they're demanding happen. If it means that much to them, they should pay the price, both in terms of what they want, in terms of how they live, also in terms of how it, much it costs. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Bill Goody Kuntz. My family and I moved to 55 Cross Hill Road in 2002 after our real estate agent lied to us, telling us that the gun club was losing members and was about to close. My concern, like that of most of my neighbors, has always been about safety. So when I read Ms. Walter's letter to the editor this morning in the Portland Press Herald, I was surprised. She wrote, in part, and I quote, a lot of hard work has been done and much has been accomplished since we began range improvements three years ago. It is our greatest hope that the new and updated Spurwink Rod and Gun Club will be a place of great pride for its current members, future members, and neighbors as we all take comfort in an improved shooting facility. It sounds to me as though they feel something has been finished. The independent consultant hired by the town council recommended that live fire be discontinued for seven reasons, none of which I believe have been done. One. All ballistics currently allowed at the range have the potential of leaving their range site and downrange users and residences are within the distance these ballistics can reach. There is currently two. There is currently no containment system in place. Three, the existing firing line shed is not sufficiently protective. Four, the club's range manual, manual is not complete. Five, security around the club's property is not substantial enough to assure accidental entry. 
Six, the existing and even proposed improvements are not sufficient to assure containment and seven, a more comprehensive containment system needs to be designed and implemented. If, as Mr. LaRosa stated in his independent report, a 30-odd six bullet, like those currently allowed at the club, can travel more than three miles in any direction if the shooter were to slip or stumble, I think the council needs more than a cheery self-congratulation from the club president <clears throat> before you grant live fire once again. Thank you. Jim Richard, 9 Cross Hill Road, Cape Elizabeth. Without overhead baffling on that range, you have no shot containment. It's the, that is the key. That is where the most expense is in developing any range. Without that overhead shot containment, they can put a round out into Fort Williams, and there is no shot containment for ricochets either. What Mr. La Rosa has recommended, far from being unreasonable and ideal, is a national standard for a modern firing range. Baffling, the walls, the berms, the backstops, etc. If you look at any of the current literature out there, that's what it calls for. What he's asking you to do is grandfather safety. That is a very dangerous move. They do not have shot containment without the overhead baffling. Thank you. Thank you. My name is William Morris, uh, 23 Cross Hill Road. Uh, I, you know, I, I just want to uh, repeat what was said um, actually twice the last two speakers uh, mentioned that uh, some of these rounds can go three miles. Uh, actually, five of the rounds can go uh, approximately three miles. I would like to know how many children and how many grandchildren, like my grandchildren, uh, live within a three mile radius of the gun club. Uh, when we brought 23 Cross Hill Road, we were not told uh, about the, the gun club. Uh, and what disgusts me, sir, is that people have no, any uh, feeling that uh, this could happen. This could definitely happen. There's a, a three mile radius, any different direction. How many children live in that three mile radius? Uh, that's what I would like to know. And hopefully we will, we will look at that uh, because there's a danger uh, without this overhead baffling. And uh, we hired a professional. We should listen to the professional, not the amateurs. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to remind folks a um, couple things. First of all, uh, your comment should be directed to the council, not to the audience. Um, it's not appropriate to um, be taking, being critical of audience members. And just to also a reminder, which I did not say at the beginning, um, asking folks um, for the no clapping, um, no emotional outbursts. Um, it needs to be that everybody here feels safe, that they can say what they'd like to say, and they're not being criticized or booed or hissed or clapped for. So just remind folks. It's part of our regular root, uh, rules, but just wanted to ask folks to do that. So thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm Ellen Nadeau, and I live at Nine Apple Tree Lane. Oops. Nine Apple Tree Lane. And uh, I would like to just present this from a little different perspective called the human side. The history of stray bullets from the gun club to many is unknown. I decided that it was important to set the record straight and describe the human side of this issue. Yes, homes in our neighborhood have, have been struck by bullets. This is not a myth or a ploy to garner sympathy. To my knowledge, there were three incidents reported to the Cape Elizabeth Police Department. Listed below is information supplied by the police department and the homeowners. Incident number one, one Cardinal Lane. The complaint was filed at 9 th uh, 9 30, 2009, and it was Officer Davis who took the report. I was informed, quote, I was informed by Chief Williams that Mark Membrino had located a had located a bullet lodged into the side of his house. Membrino had called Chief Williams, and he lives at one Cardinal Lane. Membrino. I proceeded to that location to investigate the incident. Upon arrival, I made contact with Membrino and he showed me the location of the bullet. The bullet had struck the house near the second floor. The bullet was angled in such a way as to appear to have been falling or coming from above as compared to going straight at the house. The bullet was not fully embedded into the house, so it appears the velocity had slowed considerably. I took photos of the bullet. It is unknown what caliber the bullet is, but I believe it may be a 38 based on the bullet size. Mr. Membrino's house is located behind the Spurwink Rodden Gun Club. 
The members of the club, as well as the Cape Elizabeth Police Department, use the range for firearms practice. It is likely that the bullet came from the Spurwink Garden Gun Club. The incident occurred either by an accidental discharge or someone being irresponsible and firing into the air. Mr. Mambrino stated that other residents complained of finding bullets in their houses. There have been no reports filed in the past about found bullets. End of quote. Incident number two, 25 Cross Hill Road. I received an email and spoke directly to the homeowner. We had found one, quote, we had found one bullet in the second floor window sill of our house probably about 10 years ago. It had ripped through the screen but caused no damage to the window itself. I took it to the police station. The officer working behind the desk pulled out a map and we looked at the location on our house in relation to the range and discussed that it was likely a stray bullet. I remember him saying that he knew, and she said, the president of the treasurer, question mark, question mark, I can't honestly remember, of the gum club and that he would speak with him. I did not file a formal complaint. Honestly, that is all I can tell you. To my, to my, sorry. To my knowledge, we have had no other instances of stray bullets at our house. Quote, note, the windowsill where the bullet was found was in her son's bedroom. Incident 3, 35 Cross Hill. I spoke directly with the homeowner. She believes this happened in the fall of 2009 because her house was being painted and the painter said to her he needed to show her something. He found a bullet seriously embedded in the roof shingles just above the mudroom. He dug out the bullet and gave it to her. She shared this information with another neighbor who informed her that bullets had been found in other houses in the neighborhood and encouraged her to file a report. She did not call the police. Instead, someone else called it in. Shortly afterwards, Chief, Chief Williams called and then met with her at her house. He asked her if he could take the bullet, and she said no. Could you finish yeah. up, please? I'm sorry? Could you finish up? Your three minutes are past. Okay. Um, There's a lot of other people that would like to speak. Okay. Let me finish at least on that side of the report. And it, it was possible that since, and it was said, it was possible since the house on the opposite side of the street had bullets in the rear, where the fa houses facing the house had bullets in the front. After his meeting with Chief Williams, she had never heard anything more. But, counselors, I ask you, if the workman who found the bullet had been in the wrong place at the wrong time, would he be alive today? That's my question. Sorry I can't give you the rest of my report, but thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Sarah Lund, and I live at 54 Cranbrook Drive. Thank you for having this public hearing and inviting members of the um, public to speak. I'd just like to briefly um, take very strong exception to the club's repeated characterization that this is just a neighborhood issue and that the neighbors um, have been trying so hard to shut us down and that no one else in town cares. I, I find that to be patently untrue. Um, in my experience, this is indeed very much a full town issue. Um, I know people all over town who have strong opinions about this, probably in both directions. I know people who won't ride their bikes by because they find it too unsettling and violent. Um, I know people all the way down at Broad Cove who can hear it. I live quite far away, and on a Sunday afternoon, it sounds like um, explosive going on in my, off in my backyard. I, on more than one occasion, I've called the police because I've been um, unclear what it's from. I walk my dog in Robinson Woods. You can hear the echoes from the shooting very, very clearly. I know that the issue here is not noise, but um, I also know people who are unsettled by the um, violence of the thing and the, that they find a discrepancy between our um, rural, um, peaceful town that they've moved to and the rather, um, I don't know how to say, d d opposite that they find the gun club. Um, they don't like such powerful munitions near the schools. Um, so, in short, I would just like to plead with the gun club to please stop in the media and every time you get up here, stop characterizing this as just a neighborhood issue. It is not. It is a town-wide issue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm Dan Price from 53 Cross Hill Road. Um, I, uh, I want to simply ask um, each one of the council members, uh, first of all, to vote in such a way that the uh, recommendations of the independent um, evaluator are upheld in the sense that the club should not open until those um, 
safety measures are taken into account and, um, and fixed. Um, and for those who do not vote in that way, I would like to hear each one of you um, state simply what it would take to make that vote. What would it take for you as a council member to think about citizens of your town, the taxpayers of your town, in a neighborhood approved by a body of your town as a safe neighborhood? What would it take to vote in such a way to hold up the shooting of guns until it is safe. We have heard many times that there are bullets in houses. There are many children in this neighborhood. There have been complaints from, cons from residents in a neighborhood approved by your council as a safe neighborhood. There have been complaints from them about their own safety. There has been, by your own recommendation, the appointment of an independent evaluator who is by no means and by no stretch of the imagination in bed with the neighborhood. I think we can all agree to that. And he has expressed deep concerns about safety of the neighborhood, deep concerns with very specific recommendations. And somehow, there are people sitting in front of me who think it makes sense to ignore all of that out of concern for a gun club that pays, as I understand it, very little if not any taxes, has mostly members from outside this community, and doesn't seem to care one whit about the safety of our children. So I would like to hear from you, if you vote against this, to express what it would take for you to feel comfortable in standing up against the gun club. Thank you. Eric Stephanus, New Tiger Lily Land. On the town website, I read the draft motion uh, for the shooting range facility license prepared by Monahan Leahy, the town attorney. And that's basically a worksheet, I guess, for the town council to assess whether the ordinance requirements have been met. And I also read the cover letter from Thomas Leahy to Councillor Jordan. And in that letter, he states, quote, there is an exception provision in the firing range ordinance due to hardship, and that would probably be the one requiring the most creativity. That was a red flag for me, because a lawyer talking about creativity often means an attempt to avoid or distort the obvious meaning of a statute or a regulation. So how has Mr. Leahy chosen to be creative? Well, he seems to say that bullets can't hurt you. He, his suggested wording simply asserts that, quote, if limited to target locations of 25 yards or less from the firing line, the use of live ammunition would not materially affect the safety of the surrounding neighborhoods or the general public welfare. What's the meaning of that word materially? It's usually used in financial reports to indicate that something an investor might be worried about really isn't going to affect results. In other words, it's not going to make much of a difference one way or another. So not material means doesn't make a difference. Don't worry about it. But it does make a difference if you're hit by a bullet. The town's contracted safety expert stated that bullets can escape the range. You simply can't assert that the danger has been eliminated by calling it not material. According to that interpretation, when I walk down the street in front of my house, I don't have to worry about the bullets that may leave the range because they are not material. And I guess parents don't have to worry about bullets hitting their children when they ride in the school bus on the way to school or play in their yards because bullets are actually not material. That is indeed very creative. But I don't think the creativity is called for here. I would prefer a straightforward application of the ordinance, which would require that live fire remain suspended at the entire range until all the conditions of the R Design Work Safety Report are met, including range management as well as physical improvements, and certified by a competent town-appointed inspector. Live fire is a material danger. 
You can't creatively wiggle your way around that, and I trust the town council will agree with me. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to be brief. I'm Doris Bauman I'm from 56 Cross Hill Road, and I have two requests of the council. First, please don't issue a license to the gun club until the safety problems identified by Mr. LaRosa have been corrected and all the requirements of the ordinance are met. My second request is to be sure that the corrections are verified by knowledgeable and objective experts. The firing range committee does not have the professional qualifications to make the required technical evaluations. Thank you. Thank you. Hey guys, Ezra Steinberg, 1 Chesterwood Road. Um, I just want to thank the opportunity to let us all speak. This is my uh, first town meeting. I moved up here in March um, to Maine and lived in Portland and knew that I was going to stick around up here. I was renting, so I went over to Cape Elizabeth, thought it was a great place to settle. Took one look at the Cross Hill neighborhood, didn't do my homework on the, the whole neighborhood and saw a house, loved it, bought it. Springtime comes and all of a sudden I hear these guns going off around me that uh, sounds like we're in the middle of a war zone. My fault. I, I didn't do the homework because I love the neighborhood so much. But um, ironically, you know, with a, a cold irony, I moved from the Sandy Hook Newtown area. I was right there when that all went down. So it hits a little bit close to home. Um, people before said that this isn't about safety uh, or noise to us. It is absolutely about safety and noise. I don't know. It confused me. Um, also, that members were uh, disgusted at us. I mean, I am disgusted for the fact that I was living one block away from this while this unsafe practice was going on. I had no idea. I just assumed, oh, Cape is an awesome town. We know what's going on. There's no way they'd be practicing any unsafe uh, acts over there. And then all this stuff arises. And I'm like, wow, I've been walking in the woods with, I have an infant son at home. I have two dogs. I walk right behind the, the shooting range through the Greenbelt Trails and immediately stopped once I heard about all this going on. I just, I assumed it was safe. I don't know anything about ballistics, um, but in, in reading all these reports, it seems very, very concerning. I, I guess more so it just calls into question the sort of reckless behavior that exists. Like if I take my car out on the road, I am going to make sure that it's fully inspected, that the brakes are safe before I take it out, being that I'm not going to endanger somebody else. This was all going on. I just, I don't know if people knew that it was unsafe. I assume so. If you're into firearms, you should probably know that this is unsafe stuff going on over there if you don't have a full enclosure. Um, and then I guess finally, it, it, I'm optimistic that it has to, that it can't go through because having all of this controversy exist puts way too much um, pressure that if anything were to happen in the future, there's a huge liability here. So I, I, I assume that unless we have a full enclosure with um, some other gentleman mentioned that you have to have an overhead uh, enclosure that if that doesn't happen and there is an accident, um, it's, it just seems too much liability. So, but uh, thank you so much again for, for letting us all talk. Hello, <clears throat> Edna Doe, Nine Apple Tree Lane. Um, the La Rosa report made it abundantly clear that the you know, do-it-yourself approach to gun range design is inadequate. Uh, in retrospect, it, 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 it also became evident that the Fire and Range Committee, in their, uh, their collective wisdom, was really not prepared or qualified to make a judgment on the safety aspect of the range. The, um, however, as a result of professional gun safety inspection, La Rosa report, the deficiencies of the license application were in fact revealed. As with safety, uh, I submit that as a town, we have the same exposure to deficiencies regarding wetland protection and other provisions in, in the ordinance. Um, for example, best lead management practice. The applicant shall provide a plan that shall meet or exceed standards set forth EPA lead management guideline, which is, by the way, EPA uh, 920, and I won't bore you with the rest of the digits. On the first page, the first page, first paragraph, Notice, this manual is intended to provide useful general, general, general information to shoot, shooting range owners and operators. This manual is not to be used as a substitute for consultation with scientists, engineers, attorneys, and other appropriate professionals who should be called upon to make specific recommendations in, you know, for individual range design and lead management. As far as I'm concerned, 
We all have a copy of that application. There is no lead management plan in that application. So that aspect alone, uh, I don't know how you, can, how you can pass the ordinance. Like I say, safety has been abundantly covered by, by other people. I also feel strongly about that, but I decided to uh, focus on another issue. Anyway, the application uh, sites plant vegetation and utilize organic ground cover. That's how they're going to prevent rainwater from flowing into the wetland. According to the EPA manual, grass is not impermeable. EPA 920 also states the impact of rainfall are greater in rolling, sloped terrain, or where surface water, <clears throat> excuse me, surface water bodies are located on or immediately adjacent to the range. The firing range is surrounded by a wetland. Wet grass, you know, a level, excuse me, a level lawn is little protection from runoff and, and toxic materials leaching into the wetlands. EPA 920 also recommends hard controls. By that they mean filter beds, berms, containment traps, detention ponds, dikes, ground touring, not level lawn. Um, and again, it, it's, we're back to where a reliable professional plan and an inspection to conform conformance to the, you know, should in fact be the minimum standard in terms of uh, lead management and the EPA elements of, of that, that, uh, that plan. But basically, you know, it, you know, work has commenced on the remediation plan of the 25 yard range. And you know, I recognize the hard work and the resources the club has put into remediation. However, the club has failed to recognize the safety aspects of the shooting range, and based on the aforementioned example and many others, uh, okay, uh, highly like, uh, let me just, let me get to my conclusion. I could go on and on with examples, but hopefully you will come to the conclusion that the club has failed to grasp the integrated nature of firing regulation and responsible operations management. The only responsible means to ensure public safety uh, and, and wetland protection is to require professional inspections and certifications. Counselors, I urge you to reject this application until proper inspections, detailed plans, and a build schedule, as well as a realistic funding plan, are available to ensure conformance to, to the uh, shooting range ordinance. One last comment, if I may. The ordinance makes numerous references to design, design criteria, engineers, and specific NRA and EPA references. I urge you to reject any appeal on a hardship exception. The club managers have chose to undertake a complex capital improvement project without the benefit of professional guidance. Therefore, hardship is self-created. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kathy Klein, 66 Cross Hill Road. Um, a few years ago, I read an article in USA Today that detailed an account of a woman who was shot by a stray bullet from a nearby gun range. And quite honestly, it scared me. Concerned about the safety of our town's ra range, I and a handful of neighbors started asking the council to take steps to be certain that something similar could never happen at the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club. The ordinance passed by the town strives to set standards for the club to ensure that everyone who uses it and who lives in our town is safe. The recent safety evaluation was a vital part of that process. The ordinance calls for 100% shot containment. I think the council needs to assure their constituents that the gun club has adequately addressed all the safety concerns that Mr. LaRosa outlined at the last meeting before they open any part of the range. To grant a license, the ordinance is clear that 100% shot containment is mandated. The ordinance also calls for best practices for lead management that meet or exceed what is outlined in the EPA guidelines. Mr. LaRosa estimated that the work to the entirety of the range would cost between $750,000 to $1 million. He went on to estimate that fixing only the 25-yard range would cost $200,000 to make it safe enough to permit, to permit live fire again. Instead, the gun club estimates spending $90,000 on the entire range to meet the requirements of the ordinance with only $20,000 targeted for the 25-yard line. I'm left wondering what corners are being cut to reopen the range. How is it possible to have such vastly different budgets without compromising safety? There has been a lot of negative press about this process, and some have suggested that this isn't an issue that is concerning only to a small group of people. Clearly, the turnout tonight indicates that more than a select few are concerned about safety in their homes, their own yards, and their own town. I've said this before, but I think it is important to repeat. I don't believe that anyone on the firing range committee, including myself, 
was ever qualified to, deter to determine if the club met the mandate of shot containment or satisfied environmental concerned, concerns such as lead management. We need continued professional guidance on such issues, on safety and environmental impact before the council takes any action regarding licensing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alexa Ward. I live at 1095 Sawyer Road. Um, I've lived down the street from the gun club for most of my life and have throughout that time heard some shots. There are definitely times where you hear them, but it doesn't, to me, it's never really like, it's never scared me or made me feel unsafe. Um, but the point that I wanted to make is a quick one, and it's that the, in, in the discussion about the safety of the range, <clears throat> I just think it's important to also take into account that it's not, the safety isn't just determined by shot containment, but by the responsibility of the people who are firing guns. And it's my understanding that the people, who, the members of the gun club take NRA gun safety classes. They take, they, the gun club offers hunter safety classes. And when I went once, and my mom taught me how to shoot a gun, and the amount of, of safety practices that went into that process was, it was a lot. Like, it's really, like, it's a very mindful process when these people go to shoot their guns at the gun range. It's this very small space where you're, where you're doing it, and it just doesn't seem to me like, like, I understand, like, yeah, if somebody went and shot a gun into the air, that it could, like, come back down and, and that would be bad. But, but that's not what they do. They don't just shoot guns off in the air. You know, it's, like, very much focused. This is where we're going. They're trying to shoot this teeny tiny space on a target. They're not going to be shooting them off, like, you know. And then the gun club's been there for, what, something, some 60 years, and there's, no one's ever gotten hurt, ever in that time and a woman presented a po that there was one police report in that whole entire history she said there were three incidents but it seemed like the other two were word of mouth one police report that said that there was a bullet in the house um so yeah i'm here in support of the spermic rod and gun club and i really hope that you'll issue their license thank you thank you Hello, I'm Polly Wilcox, 17 Cape Woods Drive. Can you hear me? Um, <clears throat> Councillor Jordan said something at the presentation about the difficulty about the rooster uh, months ago, which I thought was excellent. And I think it's something to think about today. This town is 250 years old. We cherish the history, and yet we also have things happening that are changing how we look at things that have been here for a long time. Let's not throw out the character of Cape Elizabeth rashly. I don't think I'm saying it right, but I loved it when you said it because it said to me that we are bigger than one part of this problem and let's use the Cape Elizabeth history to help us come to a good solution. Um, I like conflict resolution, so that's why I'm saying anything. I'm hoping that we can come up with here a win-win situation. I do not think people in the gun club do not care about kids. And I do think the people that moved in that area, some knew what they were getting into and some didn't. We almost moved there, but we bought a house that was almost done instead of starting in a newer area. I think both sides have very, very good claims, and it is very emotional. I've worked with children all my life. The thought of a, a child being hit or anyone being hit is awful to me. But can we just try to remember that guns aren't all bad, they helped us win our freedom, 
and when used responsibly, which I am so proud to live in Maine where it seems like they're much better at using them responsibly than some parts of this country. But they're also frightening to those who are not that familiar with them. And each side has a good point, but I think because we are a small community and in some ways a good model, we could come up with something that would make everyone glad to live here and be able to do both live here and learn about guns and use them in a responsible way. So I just wanted to say something. It sounds Pollyannish. I know that's my name, but I'm saying it because I think this town has come together on so many things and done so many things well. I really think this can happen. Um, and, I, and I just think pointing the blame. Nobody likes kids if they're in the gun club or gun clubs just make noise. I don't think that's what it's about. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ed Riley, and I live at 3 Chesterwood Road in Cape Elizabeth. I'd like to urge the committee, um, the town council, not to allow resumption of live fire at the gun club, even on an interim basis, until all safety deficiencies have been corrected, not just some safety deficiencies. I also urge you to um, use another professional to determine whether those deficiencies have been corrected or not. Clearly, I don't think any of us in this room are experts on that, and nor should we pretend to be. I urge you to keep safety as your number one priority above all else. Safety of the people who live downrange, and safety of the people on the firing line as well. I additionally ask the council not to invoke the hardship clause as a way of resuming live fire. Shortcuts must not be taken on something as serious as gun safety. I'd also like to remind certain members of the town council how outraged they were about a year ago when the ordinance was being developed. At that time, I wrote a letter to the town council suggesting that the hardship clause could be interpreted as a get out of jail free card for the gun club. At that suggestion that it could happen, several town council members railed at that suggestion actually outraged by it. So today I ask you to live up to that outrage and not allow the hardship clause to be used to allow the gun club to resume until all deficiencies have been met. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> my, na my name is Ralph Romano and I live at 12 Tiger Lily Lane. And uh, I've got two things I'd like to speak about that I don't think you've addressed yet. One is I think the council ought to do some serious soul searching about the firing range committee. I mean, their decision that was almost unanimous to approve licensing before they had seen the report was at least rash and maybe even reckless. Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure why, I'm not sure how they, they came to that decision almost unanimously, but I mean, I think that's something that the councilors should think about, you know, whether that is really functioning as intended. The other thing that I'd like to do is, uh, I, it just rubs me the wrong way when I hear about, well, people should have investigated to see if there was a firing range there. Well, I've lived in Cape Elizabeth for 37 out of the last 42 years. And I think I've known the firing range was there even before then. But I had no idea if it was unsafe. And before, I mean, my God, we have a town government that's supposed to be looking out for the safety of the people that are in the town. If there was an unsafe condition there, I would think that this study that was just done this last springtime probably should have been done 30 or 40 years ago. I mean, if I'm going to go and buy a house lot and build a house in Cape Elizabeth, don't expect me to go down to, Georgia, to, to a hire a, a gun safety range expert from Georgia to come up and, and survey the firing range. Number one, they'd probably never let me in because I have no business being there. It's a private club. But how would, I, how would I ever know? 
And I think that the assumption that, that the firing range was safe uh, was not a, a, you know, a, a wild one. Uh, so I, I just, that, that just rubs me the wrong way. Okay, I said about that. The other thing, too, was the, uh, the exclusion. And I, I'd like to add my mind on to that because what I think is the, uh, what, they talk about the bullets having a range of, of three miles. And I think if you read the report, even a handgun has a range of over a mile. And there is no shot containment for, for any of them, really, not, not total and complete shot con containment. Uh, you know, we heard the, we heard the uh, phrase that, that the, the gun range is safe as used as intended. And that, that got a laugh out of me because, you know, I mean, I, think about an automobile. I mean, why have seat belts and, and, and airbags? I mean, uh, automobiles aren't meant to crash into each other. They're safe as used as intended to transport people from one area to the other. So that, that argument that the gun range is safe as used as intended just doesn't, it rings pretty hollow. And, uh, you know, on, on your uh, granting an exception, you know, the exception to the rules, you, you can grant them, but you know, it says what the requested exception will not. I wish I had my glasses. <laughs> oh, materially affect the safety of the surrounding neighborhoods or the general public welfare. And I don't see how you can you can you can grant a limited exception to this because it 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 does endanger the the uh, safety of the surrounding neighborhoods, according to your expert. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Mark Membrino. I live at One Cardinal Lane. I uh, spoke up here a couple of years back um, because we found a bullet in our house. I was out <laughs> grilling out in front of my house, and I noticed that there was a bullet there, right where we, are, where we keep our grill, up on the second floor. And it also happens to be right where our screened-in porch is. So I know there's been a lot of discussion about there not being any major incidents. I can assure you that I think there's been a very major incident. That my home was struck by a bullet. The police came out. They removed the bullet. They filed a report. I've heard nothing since. People have claimed that it didn't come from the gun club, and maybe it didn't. But certainly, three homes struck, all of which are within spitting distance of my house all of which had bullets found on the exact same side of the house as my house, all of which faced the gun club directly, all three of which are directly downrange from the gun club. That report clearly states that there's a possibility this could be happening. Something looks like a duck and quacks like a duck. It's a duck. I ask that the town please consider the three main points that I heard during the safety evaluation just a month or so ago. The expert was asked, is the current plan sufficient? The answer was no. Should they be allowed to reopen before they've corrected these problems, not just to their best <coughs> idea, but to a plan done by an expert? The answer was no. Then was asked, should they be allowed to fire any weapon that they want, whenever they want there, even after these corrections are made? And the answer to that was also no. These issues are a matter of personal freedom for me. I know people have been talking about their rights. I have a right to sit on my screened-in porch and feel safe. I have the right to have my dinner out there with my children and not be worried about getting struck by a bullet. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Ty Matthewson. I'm a father of uh, one of the children on the youth shooting team. Y'all are hearing a lot about safety tonight. We, as parents, never want our children to get hurt. Part of that is being able to teach them proper firearm safety. And along that comes with proper discipline. There are so many things that children pick up by learning to properly handle a firearm that have nothing to do with guns. Later on in life, their discipline, their 
attention to detail. There's so many things that the children pick up from our gun club of learning. It, it's too long, I could talk about the benefits all night long, but I just want to express to you guys, you are hearing so much about safety, the children learn proper firearm safety, and as it was expressed before, a eight, nine-year-old little girl learns to shoot at a target this big from 50 feet away. This big, a bullet that goes straight. Can, bullets do not curb in midair. They learn to properly shoot straight. So I just want you to understand that safety goes both ways. If we can have kids there teaching them to be safe, it will continue and get safer and safer and safer as generations grow up and learn to be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, council members. My name is Tim Lindsay. I live at 5 Tenny Lane, Scarborough. I grew up in Maine. I lived in South Portland and uh, moved to Scarborough after I served four years in the military. Um, having covered the basics, I have two points I want to make. On or about October 15th, um, if things continue the way they're going, it looks like people are going to be able to carry a concealed weapon without a permit. Okay? And that should alarm everybody, because that means every Tom, Dick, and Harry can now carry a firearm. I see this club as filling a huge major need here in Cape Elizabeth. There are women and men that are going to need training because they want to carry a firearm. That's our responsibility. We can take that on. We have the manpower, we have the training and the education. Second point I wanted to make. A few weeks ago I was up doing a work project. I was the last one there and I'm locking up the gate. These three young men walked by. And I knew they were in high school, and I have a heart for high school kids. And I said, hey, guys, let me ask you a question. Would you like to learn how to handle a firearm, to be able to dismantle it, to clean it, and to be able to shoot it at a target, and, uh, and be able to feel really comfortable with it, number one? And then if you're at a party and somebody pulls out a handgun or it's lying there, know what to do with it to get people away? And they said, yeah, we'd love to try to learn that, how to fire a firearm. And I said, great. Let me ask you this. How about around Thanksgiving? Would you be interested in coming to a turkey shoot if I can get the, the membership to go along with that? And if you win, depending on how many turkeys we get, somebody walks home with a turkey. Their eyes were big. They loved it. And my point is this. I think the youth uh, are concerned with what's going on in the world, number one. Number two, there is a general interest in knowing how to handle a firearm. And that's where it starts proper training, education, and fear and respect of firearms. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Mark Doring. I live at 10 Highview Road, and I am a member of the Spur Wing Rod and Gun Club. I'm not a very active member, but I am a member. I use it to sight in my hunting rifle so I can ethically hunt. Um, and I'm only there a few times in the fall. That being said, I was not really prepared to talk this evening, but I've listened to all the arguments. And it appears that there's somewhat of a minority special interest group that are area residents that are closely located to the gun range that seem to be going after anything they can to close the gun range, be it sound abatement, which there's a state law, which it's not an issue, and therefore the members should not take that into consideration. By the way, the club has taken action to reduce the sound, despite the fact that it's not something that's required of them. Um, there are safety issues now, which seems to be the main focus. And quite frankly, the perceived safety issues. If you look at the history of the club, there are no reported injuries, none. If you look at any other operating operation in town, Paputic, Crescent Beach, Two Lights, 
If you look at the town schools, sports, if you go down to Fort Williams and other town facilities, there are quite a few injuries associated with those operations. Yet, it doesn't seem like any of this energy around safety is pointed toward that. Just in the last couple weeks, or a couple months, I believe there was two broken bones on Fort Williams. And I personally saw a gentleman I would estimate to be about 70 years old fell down stone stairs with no railing. So if we're really concerned with safety, it seems to me we've got better targets to go after and, and areas where there truly are injuries to date and that our resources would be better spent on that. I've heard a lot of people talk about whether people are qualified and whether the town's qualified, um, the range committee, I guess it is. And no, they're not. But it appears to me that they hired a consultant who is qualified. And it appears to me that the club has also gotten a design from the consultant that they are working toward completing. And they've purchased all the materials to complete that design. So the gentleman that the town picked to consult as to what is safe, they've got a design and they're implementing the design. So I would say it is unfair to the town and the members to not grant this operating license based on a minority that have bought a property that are close to a gun range when they don't want to be close to a gun range. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> um, I wrote this letter. My name is Terry Gray. I'm a resident of Cape Elizabeth, live in Broad Cove. I'm writing in support of the Spore Rink Rod and Gun Club. As a father of four boys, I see the club as a vehicle to safely train young people and older people about the safe and appropriate use of firearms. As a physician, I believe this is critical. Whether one agrees or disagrees with the personal use of weapons is not the issue. To me, it revolves around a local vehicle to educate others about how to safely and respectfully handle and discharge a firearm. It is my understanding that the range assessment found deficiencies which by the assessor's own comments are repairable. It is also my understanding that appropriate fixes are currently well underway. Given the swift and appropriate changes instituted by the club, it seems the reasons for the suspension of live fire will soon be mitigated, at least under a hard, hardship clause. The club has been a staple of Cape Elizabeth long before many of the neighborhoods ever became a thought for development. Along those lines, when our family originally moved to Cape, we looked at several areas, including Cross Hill, and put bids on several houses in Cross Hill. At that time of our search, it was made very clear that in the direct vicinity, there was an active gun club. I felt then, and I feel now, that prior to the purchase, not after, was the time to do due diligence regarding surroundings. To me, the time to decide if one wants to live near a gun club is before you buy. To have buyer's remorse later is unfortunate for all, the buyers, the sellers, the town, and the club but the burden should not fall on the club. As the saying goes, caveat emptor. Once again, I am writing this in letter of full support for the license and at least the hardship clause to be granted to the club. And I thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Garth Altenberg. I live at 31 Old Colony Lane, just down Shore Road. Simply stated, at this time, we have a firearm safety issue. We're not there yet. All the proper safety instruction can't contain a carelessly fired shot until we meet all the recommendations in the report. I don't see how in good conscience we can consider any uh, length of uh, firing range that just goes against the 100% uh, recommended shot containment in the report. I just feel we have a responsibility to this town to see that uh, 
all the recommendations of the report are met before we open. And I think we need to take that uh, with the utmost seriousness. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Jonathan Good. I'm a resident of Evans Street in South Portland. I've been a member of this club for 20 years. I'm 66 years old. I've been an NRA instructor for 43 years. Retired officer, United States oh. Army. Retired police officer. I've been here a long time listening to this. First time I've been in this chamber. First time I've listened to all the arguments, pro and con. Three things occur to me. Number one, there's some misinformation going back and forth between both sides. Reminds me like both sides need a little time out to talk it out and figure some of this stuff. But the other thing you got to remember that the first thing we teach NRA courses is keep the muzzle of the firearm pointed in a safe direction at all times. Keep your finger off the trigger till you're ready to fire. Do not load your firearm till you're ready to shoot. We pound it into people over the years. I've been teaching classes now for a long time. In the past two years, 70% of my classes are all women who want to learn how to shoot a firearm for either self-defense or competition or just knowledge. I learned to shoot in the seventh grade in the South Portland Junior High School Rifle Club. We take our 22 rifles, go down the court of the school, out in the car, drive to Fort Williams and learn how to shoot. The responsibility, the uh, discipline, and the knowledge imparted upon young people at that age serves them the rest of their life. The gentleman who talked about having a resource in this town to help people and help young people learn how to shoot and learn responsibility is, w is well thought out. I applaud that. I think there is a way for this committee to come to an agreement to keep this club open. I urge you to grant the license and work on a per diem or on a partial or graduated step basis to bring live fire back as certain parameters are met. It may be impossible to meet 100% of everything without several years effort, but there is a way that the range committee can compromise to have safety and still have the club operating. I do not know enough detail to, to, to go to the details of it all, enough of the knowledge of it, but I know the range committee and the club is working back and forth. I think they can do it and do it responsibly. I think this club is a part of the heritage the history and the part of this town and it should be kept open. I urge the committee or the council, excuse me, to uh, license the club and work together toward further improvements. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, my name is Just Joe. Just one second, sir. Yep. If anybody else wants to speak, they need to stand up and be at the microphone. Otherwise, we're going to finish when this gentleman's done. So think about that if you want to line up. <laughs> my name is Joe McGonigal. I live at 32 Cross Hill Road. I had not intended on speaking this evening until I heard <coughs> the last few speakers. <clears throat> I moved into Cross Hill Road uh, about two years ago, full well knowing there was a gun rage directly behind my home. I had no problems with that, knowing that it's Cape Elizabeth, I'm sure it's safe. Everything else is safe. The roads are safe. The schools are safe. The restaurants are safe. The gun club must be safe also. It's licensed by the city. You know, why would I think differently? And up until recently, I thought it was safe. I had no reason to think that it wasn't. But since the report has come out, I feel that there is no partial opening. It can't partially be safe. It's either safe or it isn't safe. If an airline grounds a plane because it's not safe, they don't say, well, we'll just go on some short trips until we fix it. No, they fix the plane and they fly again. <clears throat> I don't see how it could be even considered to reopen the gun club until it's completely safe. Thank you. Thank you. I saw no one stand up, so I assume that everyone who wanted to speak has. So I will close the public hearing. And thank you, everybody, for all your input. Um, and what we will do is we will now move on, um, and I will ask uh, the committee chair, Caitlin, to um, talk a little bit about the recommendation from the Fire and Marine Committee. Thank you. Um, the Fire and Marine Committee met 
several times over the course of a year, and we did our very best to become as well educated as we could on these very complex and technical issues. And we made recommendations, seven findings and four recommendations to the town council after we received an application from the Spur and Quad and Gun Club and were required by the ordinance to make an action within 30 days. We would have loved to have received this safety report before we had to make those recommendations as it may have changed some of the recommendations we put forward, some of the findings we put forward as we made specific recommendations knowing that this safety evaluation was coming forward. And so that brings us to here. And so in order to get this ball rolling, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion that we conditionally approve the Spur Rink Rod and Gun Club's application that the 25, based on that the 25 yard range be allowed to be used as long as the design and changes are made per the recommendation of the certified range design engineer that can be reviewed by our very own Ben McDougall, code enforcement officer, who is very capable of reading and understanding designs that we receive notice that the manual has been updated and approved by the NRA's safety evaluator that Mr. Rick LaRosa or any other NRA safety evaluator that wants to sign off on this range evaluation and that we have noticed either from Ben or else that the entry fence has been repaired and it is now safe and secure and there cannot be any entry to the facility that isn't wanted. And also, sorry, that the 50 and 100 yard ranges continue to have suspension of live fire until they meet the same requirements as the 25 yard range. Thank you, Caitlin. Is there somebody who'd like to second that motion? Or do you need it read back? I'm getting some head nods, Deborah. Is, do you have enough to read it back? Do you want me to try? Um, do you have it written? Not word for word. I have notes. Okay. Want me to summarize what I said? Sure. One more time. Mm. Yes, please. Because there's Conditional approval that the 25 yard range be opened once it has been determined by code enforcement officer that a range certified range design has been implemented that the manual has been updated that the fence has been repaired and that the 50 and 100 range remains suspended <coughs> until they are similarly updated per a range designer like the 25 yard range is being done. Jim. Uh, Caitlin, um, can, can we make sure that we also, that it's, a, it's signed off on by a certified range designer as well? Because you had just been as the. Well, the, the design would, in my opinion, the design would be submitted by the certified range designer. And I'm saying that I believe Ben is capable of reading and determining designs and he can see that it's built as the design says so that mm -hmm. that's his job he can molly does ben agree with that assessment are you qualified to do that <coughs> ben, you need to go to the microphone thank you <coughs> I, I would attempt to evaluate the range uh, as built, and uh, if I had any questions, I would reserve the right to uh, get the help of a professional to certify it. Yes, Michael. Just like to, you know, a lot of times when the code enforcement officer makes decisions on a whole host of issues, he, he will come to me and say, is it okay if I hire a blankety blank to, to do blank? Uh, and, you know, those are routinely granted. Uh, we, we provide Ben, the, the code enforcement officer, now Ben, uh, the, whatever assistance they need to make an informed decision. We understand the sensitivity of this issue as well. Jim. 
I know we, I know we have a motion that hasn't been seconded. Right. But the other alternative, and again, just for conversation, is to, um, is to table this decision till the October meeting, at which time we'll have another four weeks of the work that's being done at this club and the ability to certify, potentially, prior to taking up the decision that's in front of us. So, you know, I mean, that's another alternative. I get, there are two, two completely different sort of tracks here. I just think it's important that the council considers that as, as an option um, and one that I don't want to delay this. I mean, this has been going on for three years. It's actually four because somebody mentioned earlier that, oh, this last comment here from the fellow from South Portland, Mr. Good, that, you know, the, the misinformation and the fact that people should be talking to each other. Well, if you remember correctly, the first year, that was what was supposed to be happening between Cross Hill and, and, the, and the gun club. So I would suggest that that's another alternative. And again, I, I don't know whether you make a motion on top of a motion or you wait until there's a second and then you make a motion to table. I, I, I don't, I'm trying to understand what the next step might very well be. Well, we have a motion on the table. Does someone want to second Caitlin's motion? Can I ask another question sure. before we do that? Yes. To me, the, the biggest issue, whether it's 25 yards or 50 or 100 yards, obviously we've talked about it all night tonight, it's safety. And my question is, if we grant the conditional approval at 25 yards, do we have 100% shot containment? And is it safe? And who answers that question? And is that Ben or is that the uh, Mr. LaRosa coming back to give us his stamp of approval. Let me briefly try to answer that. Ultimately, it's the code enforcement officer. Mr. LaRosa is simply an advisor to the code enforcement officer, you know, once it gets, gets beyond, beyond a certain point. Thank you. So can you answer that question? Well, we, we've received a set of architectural plans for the range from Mr. LaRosa. We've received a set of structural plans from a structural engineer that demonstrates all the everything stays upright. Uh, you know, it is my job to analyze plans for as-built compliance. Uh, with the sensitivity of this issue, I, I probably would get the help of a professional to have a second set of eyes on it. But uh, if the plan is implemented, you know, Mr. LaRosa, the range designer, has certified with his architectural seal that it's 100% shot containment. So, just so I'm clear, sorry, Kathy. No, it's all right. Okay. Yes. Just so I'm clear, if we were to grant conditional approvement, uh, approval this evening, then you would move forward with working with the folks at the club to ensure that that 100% shot containment was actually in place, and before there were live fire allowed there again, that would be the case, that 100% that, that shot containment would be in place and operational, correct? Yes, yeah, okay. based on that motion, that's what would happen. Okay. And Michael, go ahead. I have not one other question to Okay. And uh, it might be a question for you. Someone here raised the issue of the environmental impact and the, I think it was Mr. Netto who raised the issue about uh, lead and the environmental impact of that, who is responsible, and again, maybe it's you, who is responsible for ensuring that that lead management plan is in place, and who gives the final okay on that? Is that you? Is that the DEP? Is it according to EPA standards? Is it something else? Well, uh, they have, they submitted a lead management plan based on the EPA best management practices. It's, it's in their application. Uh, that's, that's a difficult one to enforce. I'm not a soil chemist. I don't, I don't know a lot about how lead migrates through the soil. Uh, but, you know, the club has agreed to implement the lead management plan. Uh, I, I don't know who would, I'm not sure who would satisfactorily enforce that. I would certainly, I, I would certainly try to. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Michael, did you want to say yeah, something? Yeah, I did want to say something. I wanted to look something up, but unfortunately my internet's not working. Yeah, it, 
You know, my sense is, and the town attorney could correct me if I'm wrong, when you look at the ordinance, the shooting range ordinance, it contemplates when the council receives a, an application and reviews it, that there's certain conditions that, that do need to be met in order to grant that permit. And through the chair of the town attorney, wouldn't the council need to even do a conditional permit, need to have certain findings of fact of seeing that certain standards in the ordinance are met? Thank you, Tom. Uh, yes, I think any motion should make the findings that the criteria of the ordinance has ha have been met. There are stated criteria. I suggested findings. I said they have been or have not been. Um, I don't know what will happen after uh, a decision tonight, but it's obviously potentially appealed, and we'd like to have findings of fact made in connection with any motion that's made uh, tonight. Okay. Thank you. So, Caitlin, did you want to... I haven't heard a second yet, but um, I think that we've also heard from Tom that maybe part of the motion needs to be the findings of fact. Do you want to? Do you, do you have those? Well, I'm, I'm just saying I haven't heard a second, so um, if you want... It, so far, nobody seconded your motion, so oh, it's I somewhat, I somewhat, uh, I, I think there's questions. No, usually a motion needs to be made in order to have a discussion. Right. So that's what I was trying to get to, but obviously we're having a discussion without a motion. So <clears throat> I can certainly read through the findings of fact as I see them, or we can continue our discussion and have some findings and then move forward like the planning board does. So I think that's kind of where we're moving towards a planning board, like in the fire committee, we had to come up with the findings of fact and then move forward through them. So whichever you would like, but it seems silly that, you know, I, I need to come up with all the findings and we can then discuss them beyond. But I'm more than welcome to read all of these findings. Do other counselors have some preference here? Uh, Jessica. Yeah, I have. Uh, several questions, but I'm happy to, to second the motion to move the discussion forward, and um, I may entertain an amendment to the motion. Okay. So, with that said, I would like to second the motion that is on the table mm -hmm. um, with uh, the, the amendment or the addition, I don't know if I can say it that way, the addition of the review of the findings of fact. Caitlin, is that? No, that's fine. Okay. And so now we can move the discussion forward because the motion's been seconded. Okay. okay. Great. Who wants to? Did you want to continue? Were you not finished? Would you like? No, I'm, I'm okay. I, I will jump in here, but. All right. I, yeah. <clears throat> Other counselors? Caitlin? Well, do you just want to, I mean, start? I mean, Tom has done a wonderful job of creating these findings of fact. They're very similar to the findings that we had to lay out for the firing range committee, so we could just as easily go through one at a time and see. Is that satisfactory to the? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. so we'll do that. Yeah. All right, so um, Caitlin, do you want to start? I can run okay. that. Very good. Did it once before. Start with number one. The Sperwin Grodden Gun Club owns and operates the shooting range facility located at 1250 Sawyer Road, Cape Elizabeth in existence since 1955 and hereby is deemed an existing shooting range facility under the Cape Elizabeth Shooting Range Ordinance, Chapter 24. Is every, everyone okay with number one? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. All right. The Spurman Garden Gun Club has timely submitted a license application under Article 8 of the ordinance, including the required site plan under Section 2484. Everyone all right with that? Yes, Jim? Yes? Yeah. I did, I'm sorry, I didn't see your head. <laughs> okay, thank you. The town retained an independent safety evaluator, our design works of Kennesaw, Georgia, to evaluate the Spurman Garden Gun Club facility under the standards of the ordinance. Yes? Yeah. 
Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. I guess if it's not a yes, like flat me or something. Let Jump me know. up and. Yeah, hands or something. Thank you. Richard F. LaRosa of R Design Works, a Maine licensed architect, provided a final report dated July 27, 2015 to the town and gave a summary of the findings to the at the town council workshop on August 10, 2015. I, my only thing is, wasn't it a town council meeting? It wasn't a meeting. I think it was. Yes. Not a workshop. It wasn't a meeting. So we should just amend that. If you change the word to meeting, it would cover it either way. That's what I'm saying. So adjust that to the town council meeting on August 10, 2015. Okay. Finding number five. Prior to receipt of the R Design Works report, the town council, uh, sorry, the Cape Elizabeth Firing Range Committee on what date did we do that? Sorry. Seven, <laughs> July 13th, 2015, made its findings and recommendations as to the application to the town council, including that the license application be approved, but recommending that the town council ask the independent safety evaluator about the Spur and Garden Gun Club's phasing plans, particularly as to shot containment and facility design. Mm -hmm. We did that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Based upon a draft report from our design works dated July 21, 2015, the town's chief of police ordered live ammunition use be suspended pending review of the application. Okay. Mm -hmm. Flying through them. Spurman Guard and Gun Club is currently operated, is, is not in compliance with section 2463 in regard to warning signs, meetings, the NRA range source standards. So, sorry. So this read that as is in compliance with the warning signs meetings, the NRA source mm -hmm. standards. Does everybody agree that they're in compliance with the sign standards? I don't know if they are in compliance. Yeah, right. Ben, would you, could you address well, that? I can, from the. Are they? Well, that's the question, I think. Well, when, I mean, having. The firing range committee reviewed that. I just, we spent lots of time going over these exact same findings and we did a site walk and there are signs. I think that there was some question about signage, so maybe um, we could get the, that answered. The, the firing range committee found, about a year ago, the firing range committee found that the signs were compliant. Uh, we, we did a site walk and the signs were analyzed. But, but did we not get something in the safety evaluation that talked about signage and additional signage being needed? Am I missing something? No? Yes. And, and Ben, as I'm sorry. Excuse me, we're going to just have the council talk, if we could, please. Okay. Molly. Thank you. And in your opinion, they're in compliance? Uh, did Mr. LaRosa, I, if he required additional signage, then maybe then there could be additional signage required. I haven't... I don't know the I answer to that question. I thought there was some request for additional signage, but I thought that the gun club the, the, complied with it. You know, the council could address this issue by, by saying, believes it's in compliance and requires that all, all signs be placed as recommended by the safety study to ensure that it is in compliance. You know, just, just a way to cover it to, to get your intent for all the signage to be there. Uh, um, is that just right? to be sure. Yes. It's up to the council. I'm just trying to Ask suggest me. ways to Yes, thank you. No, we to get through it. So we don't okay. stop on too many things. Right. Is that all right with councillors? Yep. Yeah, yeah, do you complete. have enough information to yes. yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Do you, you want to write something in here? Thank you, Caitlin. Do you wanna move keep going? I can. Sorry. And what number we're on. Eight. 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 The Spurring Garden Club, as currently operated, is found to be exempt from Section 2464 as to setback requirements from existing occupied dwellings as an existing shooting range facility at the time of the adoption of the ordinance. Yes. And the firing range committee determined that, did they not? Yes. 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 Okay. Is everyone all right with that? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Nine. The Spur and Garden Gun Club, as currently operated, is found to be in compliance with Section 2465 in regard to access limitations 
with adequate security and control of ingress and egress with a coded padlock or without substantial and delineated sec security to prevent accidental entry. I think this was also in the security yes, was. Um, report. So um, do we want, Michael, you suggest that we also do something along the same lines as we did with number seven? Is that any more with that obscurity or without substantial delaying obscurity? Let's go over to the microphone and stay there, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm just reading that. Sorry, Tom. That's all right. Thank you. Uh, when I was asked to draft findings of fact, obviously I'm not the counsel, and I just try to state them in either or. So in this one is, would be, is found to be in compliance with adequate security and control of ingress or egress? Or, if you found the opposite, is not found to be in compliance because it's without substantial and delineated security to prevent accidental entry. It was an either or presentation. I gotta reread it. Not a problem. <coughs> Ready? So, I'll, I get it. I'll read it for you. Okay. The Spur and Garden Gut Club is currently operate, as currently operated, is found to be in compliance with Section 2465 in regard to access limitations with adequate security and control of ingress and egress with a coded padlock. So I guess I'll ask the question again. I believe this was part of the security report, the safety report that we saw, and so I'm not sure that I know that that's the case. So can we add that same conditional language that Michael had just recommended on item number seven, seven. I think it was. Right. You know, I think, you know, one of the issues is, is that it's not currently being operated as a live firing range. Right. There's a lot of construction activity. So, you know, this is obviously something that you want to make sure, you know, is fully in place at the time that live firing resumes. So, you know, if, you, if that is what happens in this license. So, you, you, you just need to find a way to tie that down. Kathy? Yes. We also received an email from Rick LaRosa saying that he re was visited the site and saw that the egress and ingress fence had been fixed and looked good. Okay. Um, does, does that completely address what was in the security of the state? I'm sorry, I keep saying it. Safety evaluation? Other than if you, you adopt that same la that boilerplate language that you put in seven to just cover right. Right. The, that, all of those my, other that's elements. That's what I'm trying to yeah. suggest. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm fine with it if, if that's included. It's very similar to like the conditions I put at the beginning of the motion. Right. That it has to be documented that the fence is secure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have enough information, Deborah, to? Could, could everyone on the council speak loud? I can't even hear them, so I can imagine. I'm sorry. So if everyone could speak loud enough so that I can hear, maybe everyone else will be deaf myself. It takes all the fun out of it. <laughs> yes, certainly. Jessica. Yeah, I'm, I'm in support of, of buttoning that down in the language. I mean, the committee in, initially felt that the uh, gun club was secure, but Mr. La Rosa did not agree. And um, it seems that the, the remedies are <clears throat> fairly straightforward. And so if we could, you know, uh, add language that would cover that um, in the event. So I, you know, I, I would like to move that forward as well, given the extra language. Do you have enough, Deborah, to know what that should say? Or do you want to read to I, us what I might believe say? and you can... Yes, Correct me if I'm wrong. certainly. It would be added in number seven and number nine, and as recommended in the safety report. Yes. So, and as recommended in the safety mm -hmm. report. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? To well, the yeah. question and, is and certified by the code enforcement Correct. officer at the, at, the, at the time of something. I, you know, that you need to figure that one out. Should live fire con be mm -hmm. reinstated? Mm -hmm. You mentioned that. Now, you know, my, my point is if, if you want to, if you want to have these standards, if you want to have these conditional pieces, there just needs to be a little bit of instruction to the code enforcement officer as to, as to, and, and to, so everyone has a clear understanding going forward of when those judgments are made. You know, is this, is this at, at the presumption of 
the resumption of live firing? I'm, I'm not sure. Molly, and then Jamie. I'm assuming it yes. is. Yes. Yeah, I am before too. The resumption of before. Live fire. Because yeah. The, yeah, because the, it, it's either or, 100%. Exactly. You're period. either in compliance okay. or you're not. That's so, yeah, what the exactly. motion on the table says. We need someone says, to tell yeah. us that yeah. they are yeah. in compliance. Yeah. That's what the motion on the table states. Hmm. Uh, I'm sorry, Jamie's next. Yeah, uh, the problem I had with that is right now, as it reads, it says, as currently operated, is found in compliance. And if we're making that finding effect tonight, we can do that, right? If we still have question marks. Hmm. Well, I. Jessica? Oh, well, I, I would, you know, just, I would ask that the language say something to the effect of prior to the, prior to the, um, resumption, resumption, uh, resumption of live fire, fire. That right. it be certified. Yeah. Um, by code enforcement that all the the security improvements have been have been made you know, just if I might yep. you really need to think this thing through because you know as you you get down to a, a few more findings of fact you know the, the big thing is going to be the shock containment one mm -hmm. and and others and you know you, you just need to be sure that you have a standard under, that you have a common understanding in the public, in the Rod and Gun Club has a common understanding of what needs to be done in order for X to happen at Y time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because there's, there's other things, you know, you know you, I don't want to be presumptuous, but I assume you won't find tonight that as of tonight there's 100% shot containment because I don't think I've heard any evidence of that. But you've got, to, you, you've got to find a way, when you get to that finding, that, that somehow you deal with that. And so, you know, we're, we're dealing with that issue. And, you know, and generally with, with permits or licenses, you know, you grant a license subject on, you know, if you, if you grant, you know, a, a, you know, for a new subdivision for roads we built, then there's a process that certifies that the road is in fact built, and, and then we accept them, and it becomes operationalized. You know, unfortunately, this ordinance, doesn't have the history of the development. It, does, it doesn't have all those performance guarantees in the body of the ordinance. So as a result, the council, you know, obviously is going to struggle a little bit tonight to get through this, but you, you're just gonna have to struggle with it and find, find a way, if you wanna make sure there's absolute guarantees of something that happens, you gotta find a way of putting it in the language as you go through this this evening or at least talk about what you'd like to see, so if you then ultimately decide to table it the next month, you're, you're comfortable with the language. But there just needs to be something that, that pins it down that guarantees performance. And I'm not, I'm not picking on the gun club. This is the way with any application or, or any license we have. Thank you, Mike. Um, okay, uh, Molly. I just wanted to follow up with that. I, I see it as very similar to a certificate of occupancy for a new building. It's not very different from that. Before you can occupy a new building, we have the code enforcement officer of whichever community the new building is being built in certify that the life safety code issues have been addressed. And I don't see this as any different. So I, while I agree with you, um, Mike, I think we're still working through the process of how we make that happen. I think the end result is we're trying to get to the same place. We want whether it's Mr. La Rosa or, or our code enforcement officer, with the help of Mr. La Rosa to guarantee that for us, to tell us that the ordinance as it's been written has been implemented properly, and that when the club reopens, it's reopened <coughs> on the terms that we in the community all think it should be. I, I don't think it's more complicated than that. Patty. I, I'm wondering if, um, with knowing that intent, to me, I'm feeling like we're and you're saying that we're going to struggle through this. I'm wondering if we can't just put intent of language, get agreement around it, and perhaps have the attorney come, we draft it, and we bring it back with language that we know that's in front of us that we're agreed on, you know, or do we want to, you know, so that we could table it and come back to it, or do we want to struggle through the exact language or just look for intent? Michael? Caitlin, Oh, I'm sorry, Caitlin, I didn't see you. I was just going to comment with similar to Patty's. I think the a problem with what we're doing is we're, we're trying to read the lawyer's language, and it was prepared not knowing what was going to happen tonight. And so I was almost going to say when we got back on here that I think 
we're struggling because I'm reading word for word what he wrote and it's not fitting into what we want. So it's almost like we need to look at, okay, so the next one is lead management. We need to come up with the finding because that's what we did with this, the, the firing range committee. We, we checked off what things we needed to be looking at and then we came up with those findings that we sent you. We didn't have them pre-written. It's something we need to do. And so when we get to the shock containment one, it's going to be really hard for me to read that one because we're going to need to make all kinds of changes to it. So I think, yes, we need to step back and be rewriting them ourselves as a council. Michael. Just, just, uh, you know, like, you know, I, they need to be the council's finding of fact and not the attorney's. Okay. The attorney does a draft. You know, even if you decide to you know, go through this and struggle through it, you, know, you, can, you can still table it. I think it's important that you at least get through it all and struggle through it all. So even if you ultimately do decide to put it off until you see all you're comfortable and you know all the final wording, at least you know, we, we know what the town attorney knows what to draft in order to get the next draft before you. Is everybody you. okay? Oh, Jamie, yes. are we okay with that? Yeah, well, my thought is that it's probably our duty tonight to go through the findings of fact so that we give clear vision to the town and to the gun club to let them know what we find as of this moment um, and then give them a, a yes a yes or no on the license as of this moment unless one of the counselors feels obliged to make a motion for a hardship exemption so that's where the unless comes into play um, but I, I think if we go through this and we say you haven't complied with x y and z here's the three things you have to work on then they have guidance um, and then we can say yes or no on the license as of now. I don't know that makes a big difference to say, we'll give you a conditional license if you fix these three things, or we say no, go fix these three things. It's just, you know, it's Same. six of one. Okay. That so matter. let's see if we can continue to struggle through okay. this, because um, <laughs> we could probably all say some more things, but, and we will probably. Uh, almost, on, but, almost there. So we're at nine, and I think, I think if we understood and Deborah was taking notes that we wanted nine to be also in compliance with the safety evaluation. Did we? Right. Are we? We did. Okay. Yep. All right. So let's move on to 10. The Spur and Grodden Gun Club is currently, as currently operated, is in compliance with the best management practices requirement of section 2472 relating to lead management, as evidenced by the EPA lead management plan attached to its application which include including record keeping and annual review. Jamie. I don't know the answer to that question. And I think, um, Ben, did you not go out there with um, someone from the DEP? Did you, maybe you could address that. I did visit the site on August 5th with uh, Jennifer Harris from the DEP, but we did not get into lead issues. We were, she was looking at it from a Natural Resource Protection Act uh, point of view, and I was looking at it from local zoning perspective. Okay. Okay. Question? Yes, Caitlin. Did she mention any issues that she saw from a natural resource perspective to you? Uh, she she asked them to improve a, a small section of erosion control and uh, otherwise said the site was in compliance with the Natural Resources Protection Act. Michael? As part of the application process to the Firing Range Committee, was something submitted to show compliance with this? Yes. Yes. And yep. who, who, who was it from? Was it, you know, I, I just don't know. I'm being a mess because I don't know. It's from the club itself. Was, was there anyone, was there an end of, was, did someone who had uh, qualifications in that area certify that those conditions were met? I don't believe so. It's, well, we were given information about the EP led, man, led management and how to do it, plan, and they submitted a plan to manage. I mean, it's, it's, very, it's not, there's not too much information out there to, to, to give guidance. I mean, they don't have anything that they were out of compliance with, so all they had to do is come up with best management practices 
according to the EAP guidelines of what some best management practices are, and they submitted those. So the answer to Mike's question is no. There was no independent DEP evaluation done by the Firing Range Committee, no. Um, ben, is that something that the DEP does do? I'm, I'm not aware that they do that. Okay. Do you, are you aware of who might do that? I, I think we'd have to hire an independent scientist to do that, a hydrogeologist. Or okay. Something. Thank you. Uh, uh, Patty? I guess I'm looking at under um, Mr. Loros's report and recommendations. Um, he makes recommendations on number seven when he says that to deal with sh complete shock containment, um, the very last sentence he says that at that time when they're looking at berms and those kinds of things, um, that environment issues need to be addressed if desired at this time also. And I would guess then because he doesn't make any other specific recommendation, probably like Ben saying, someone would need to be, um, you know, hired or, or um, assigned or procured to make sure that there's proper um, dealings with that. If that's the will of the council. If that's the will of the council. So the question is, what does the council want to do? As a thought. Molly? Uh, I would lean toward requiring that we had some sort of approval <coughs> or certification for the lead management plan. I think it's an environmental issue. It, 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 to say it's Cape Elizabeth. We have a, a community that's very, typically very concerned about the environment, and I don't see this as being any different. So I don't know who that would be, who would do that certification, but I, I think it would behoove us to at least ask the question, who is out there who could do that? Other counselors? Jessica. We could put a time frame on that. The, the committee did, did um, unanimous, unanimously approve the gun club's e uh, lead management uh, practice. So if there, you know, we're hearing additional concerns from the community, however, to my way of thinking, this is something we could put a timeline on. We could say conditional upon a report satisfactory, you know, to be received within six months or something like that. I don't, I don't see I'm that okay personally. I mean, yes, you know, we all have environmental concerns naturally, but to me, um, the shot containment issue is a far more urgent one, shall we say. I think that um, we can give some time for this, for the uh, EPA lead management practice certification to take place. So let me make sure I understand because, you know, we, the motion has is been to grant um, the license um, conditional on some things. If you're saying this is six months to do this, are you saying that you do not intend to grant the conditional license for live, say, for live fire until this is, item is met? Because I think that's important to think about. No, no. Okay. I, I just yeah. want to make sure because... No, I, I would say that uh, we, if we granted a license contingent upon certain things, one of them might be 100% shot containment immediately. Uh, or, uh, and then an EPA uh, evaluation to be certified by someone qualified due to the council or the firing range committee within six months, something like that. Okay. What are other counselors? I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if that's. I, you know, I, I'm neither agreeing nor disagreeing. Okay. I'm, I'm just trying to help with process. I, I think you'd, you'd want to have something to the effect that that's the direction you want to go. Re provided that the code enforcement officer receives yep. what you said. I don't think you want this to go back to the firing range committee. No. You know, their, their, their role in the licensing was to make a recommendation to the council. I think the council makes a decision one way or another, and if you want to put certain conditions that, that there to be certain things done, I think it really goes back to the code enforcement officer to, to have that certification. I agree, and I misspoke. I do agree. It should go back to the code enforcement officer. Jim. Uh, I guess the question I have is why wait six months? 
I mean, we're setting another parameter out there. Frankly, let's keep it clean. Let's keep it all focused on live fire and 100% shot containment and have a lead plan delivered to the code enforcement officer at the same time. I mean, well, I mean it's a major, it's, it's been addressed by many community members in, in emails today to us that this is a concern. And I think that when the gun club presented this, it, it seemed comprehensive, again, to those of us who are not professionals. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, I, I wouldn't, I don't, want, I don't want to wait six months. I think the sooner we get to it, the, the clearer it's going to be that they've, been, they've become compliant. So, Caitlin and then Patty. I was just going to say, a plan has been submitted. It's in the application. Um, so we need to be clear as to what we're asking to receive. Are we asking to receive for a DE, DEP agent come out and say, you know, this plan is good, you're, you're in compliance? And we, I just want to make sure we specifically state what we're looking for, because if we're just saying we're looking for a lead management plan, well, we have one. So let's be specific as to what we want to be receiving back. Well, that, we, we can't require the DEP to do anything as a town. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, who does this, it, the importance is, is they have expertise. And my, my guess is that the DEP would say, you know, this isn't a service we provide. Uh, so it would need to be, uh, you know, e e either, you know, you rely on the assurance that you've already gotten. That's one option. Or secondly, you require some outside, the code enforcement officer, you, you, you suggest that you get some outside expertise. But I think leaving it to DEP would probably result in a, in a condition that's not meetable is, is my concern. I just, a question. Can I have some background as to how the DEP got out there, you said on August 5th, and reviewed, what did they, like, how would they get there and what did they review? Is uh, both myself and the DEP received uh, complaints that, uh, that, that the gun club was filling wetland. And so we were going out there jointly to uh, evaluate the site to see if there was wetland disturbance or fill occurring. Patty, I think you were next. Um, I've kind of thought might change of thought, but I think that just, it might make sense just to make sure that we have ex some expert review what's being done with the lead management plan to make sure that we're doing something that makes sense and wasn't drafted. It's, it was an appropriate plan. Um, and I guess you could leave that to Ben to uh, assure that they have some type of expert to do that. What my worry is when I look at this, and I'll refer back to nine, is that when, there's, when Mr. La Rosa said, talked about environmental issues, he says at this time, it's because they're talking about creating berms and the things needed for shot containment. So I believe, based on how I'm reading this, and I could be wrong, that they do, as Jim's suggesting, kind of need to go hand in hand. You can't get shot containment, perhaps, without making sure that we're looking at this um, lead management issue at the same time. Anybody else want to see? Uh, Jamie. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to refer back to the the ordinance to see what we're at if we're asking the club to do what's required by the ordinance. Um, they submitted a copy of the EPA lead management plan. The finding, the proposed finding of fact says, are they in compliance with best management practices relating to lead management or are they not? Just the submission of a lead management plan doesn't make you in compliance with it. So we, if we're being asked to make a finding of fact that they're in compliance with that, I haven't heard any evidence of that yet. So I, I couldn't make that finding. So am I hearing town councilors say that they would like to have um, um, Ben find a, a, someone who was an expert who could um, make a determination about um, lead, lead management? Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, Molly. I would say yes, but I'm not in disagreement with Jessica. I don't mind giving the process a little time to play out because um, I don't think there's anyone in this room who knows who that expert might be. So, um, and I, despite my concern for the environment and the proper approach to this, 
I, I don't see a huge drawback given that the club has been operating for, I'm going to take a shot in the dark as it were, 60 plus years. I'm not worried about another three months on the lead issue, but I don't want it to drag on beyond some pretty limited period of time. So I'd want to make sure that we had a plan for Ben to find, I'm assuming it would be Ben, to find an appropriate resource person to to give him and therefore give us the, the uh, sense that that has been complied with. And it's not just that they've submitted their, their lead plan, their lead management plan, but that someone has approved it who knows what they're looking at, because I don't think that's us. So here's just a little snag that I'll put in that. Um, if we're requiring that an expert do a lead management plan, who's paying for it? I don't know how much it's going to cost. I don't have a clue. But I think we have to address who's paying for it. And, and we're not asking them to do the plan, right? We're asking them to have it certified the, by a professional. Yes, to right. approve that's the plan all. that's been done. Um, I, just, I just throw that out because, you know, um, we can do all this and then the bill comes in and somebody says, uh, who's paying this? So unless Michael thinks I'm off on that, I, I think that, you know, I think the default is when you require an applicant to do something, it's on their nickel unless you specifically say otherwise. I know with the safety evaluation, we specifically ordered it because we wanted to be the body that said we want the safety evaluation and we didn't want it questioned by others that said you had this this person had it but you know so they were questioning the validity because so, council agreed to pay for that that's right so yeah, but remember they submitted one and we didn't think it went far enough that's right so and this is a little bit different i think what we're saying here is we want somebody to just professionally look at the plan they've submitted and to certify that it is appropriate or acceptable, end of story. I think that's all we're looking for here, because mm -hmm. there's enough questions about it from um, everybody. Ben? It, 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 if you say the applicant is required to demonstrate that their lead management plan is compliant, then, then it's on their nickel. If you say Ben needs to confirm that that plan is compliant, then it's on the town's nickel. Okay. Jamie. <clears throat> to, we've got to be fair to the gun club here. 20, section 2472 says outdoor shooting range facilities shall provide a plan outlining its best management practices relating to lead management. Said plan shall meet or exceed standards set forth in the EPA lead management guidelines. They submitted the EPA lead management guidelines, mm -hmm. so it meets those. I think by the submission of it, they have complied with the statute, whether or not they're fulfilling what the lead management guidelines, that's a question for Ben. For ben. Whether or not they're, they've submitted a plan that they're not living up to is a question for Ben, I believe. Others? Mm -hmm. Counselors, yes, no? Just that this firing range committee voted unanimously, having received that information, that they weren't compliant, having submitted their management plan. So are we wrapping back around to say that we think that this is in compliance? Or? I think they complied with what the ordinance requires. Jessica. Yeah, I'm, I, I was just reviewing that myself, um, Councilor Wagner, and I agree because it does appear, and the committee, as I mentioned, did unanimously accept that. It does appear that they have met the standard we set in the ordinance. Um, so are we getting a head nod on 10 at this point? Sounds like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Molly, are you nodding uh, your I'm, head? I'm, I'm not comfortable with that. I would rather that we agreed to pay for the expert to give us a stamp of approval on that lead management plan than just accept the fact that it's been submitted and walk away from what I think is our responsibility to ensure that, that we're doing the right thing. And I, I, truly, I don't see it as much different from what Ben would provide 
in an opening of a new building, that you would not give a certificate of occupancy if you didn't know that the, all the bases were covered. I, I don't see any difference. So if we have to pay something for that, and, and at least on the first time around, if we had to do this again in the future, we might want to sharpen that up in our ordinance. But I think this time around, I think we're still making our way through this process, and I think we have a, an obligation to do it the right way. Yeah, Kathy, usually with findings of fact, when the minutes appear, it would show that everything you had voted up to now, when each finding of fact was seven to nothing. You didn't take formal votes, but you know there was, there was consensus, and then you take a vote on the whole thing. You know, in, in a case where there is an agreement on the finding of fact, my suggest would be suggest would be the minutes reflect whatever the division is. Okay. So is the division six one? No, I would I tend to lean towards what Molly's okay. suggestion as well. I All feel right. like it would be our responsibility. So is it five two? I, I mean I believe they're compliant with what the ordinance requires. Whether or not the town then decides to help Ben out with by hiring a guy to make sure they're in compliance with that's a different question. So I'm with the five on this one. Okay. All right. Whatever you have that? I do, thank you. Okay, we'll move on to 11. Um, this, oh, ahead, sorry. sorry. <laughs> the Spur Wing Rod and Gun Club, as currently operated, is currently in compliance with Section 2474 of the ordinance, having provided the town with a certificate of liability insurance in the aggregate amount of $3 million and with the town named as an additionally insured. Yes. 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 Oh, look at that. All right. Well, an easy one. The Spruant Grot and Gun Club, as currently operated, is found to be exempt from the noise mitigation provisions of Section 2452 as an existing shooting range facility at the time of the adoption of the ordinance. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thirteen. The Spruant Grot and Gun Club is not found to be in compliance with shot containment provisions Section 2451 as it is not designed to contain the bullets, shots, and ricochets of same discharged at or within the shooting range facility due to the relationship between the firing lane, target locations, and existing ridge and nearby occupied dwellings. Do you, do you say she is said not? Is not. Because I imagine we're adding whatever language as to right. the designs and Ben and that needs to be done. Are people in agreement with that? Yep. Right, yes. All right. Okay. So, um, so 14. I don't know how you want to. So, I, yeah, I don't know if you want to go into hardship for that or if you just want to tack on, like we've been tacking on all the other ones, that number 13 needs to have the design signed off by the certified NRA design expert and implemented and Ben, with the assistance of his expert, say that it's been built to the designs required by the NRA design expert mm -hmm. to contain, to achieve 100% shock containment. Comments from Tom? Oh, Tom, thank you. I, I think at this point, if you're, um, if you, do, if you do not make a positive finding in shock containment, then I think you need to go to the exception, find hardship, and then from there. <clears throat> so you're not making a finding of 100% shock containment. I think you have to then go, if you're going to have a positive motion to approve the license, it sounds like you're in the exception. Okay. Well, as it's currently operated, it has 100% shock containment. Mm -hmm. so, um, so how can, well, we, yeah, we, Molly? I, I'm confused because I thought what we were doing was walking through this document right now with the findings of fact and that at some point, I'm guessing it's at our next regular meeting, that we would then be responding to this as it's revised. And I think what Caitlin just outlined was that rather than headed in the direction of number 14, where we would grant a conditional license because of hardship, that instead we would be looking, I'll call it, for the Ben McDougall route, which is the, 
um, move ahead with the approval based on the sign-off from the code enforcement officer that there is 100% shot containment. Is that, am I? Well, you, you got need to understand that we have a motion and a second on the table. So, um, you know, potentially you could be voting this evening. But or we're still in be, discussion. But we're in still in discussion. Or, or somebody could make a motion to table it pending whatever information they want. I learned last, I'm sorry. No, I learned last month if we table it, we end the discussion. That's right. That's I, I got school. Yeah. I don't want to get that tonight. That's, that's right. If it's, if it's tabled, that's the end of the discussion. So can I rephrase number 13 as we've stated all the others with the with the extra add-on because we've affirmed everything else and then yeah. right so I'll I was trying to be helpful but obviously not so the spur and Garden gun club is found to be in compliance with shock containment provision section 2451 as it is designed to contain the bullets shot and ricochets of same discharged at or within the shooting range facility due to the relationship, elevation, distance, and allowed ballistics between the firing line, targeting locations, and existing ridge and nearby occupied dwellings. Once we receive the designs from a certified NRA design expert. Well, Michael? I'm, I'm confused. So uh, am I. <laughs> yeah. I, I, just to make sure we understand this, you're saying it, it is in compliance, and then I, you sort of tailed off at the end there. I just want to make sure we, we all heard it. It's the same. I don't know how to word it, because yeah. clearly. But every time on all these other findings, we've said that as currently operated, the fence works, but then we said we need to have the fence check. So I'm trying to say, right. we're going to say they've got shot in payment, but we get the check. And we're, if we're going to do all that for all the other findings, then we might as well go down that same logic for this last finding. No, I, I, I think I understand now. So, so, so what you're going to be doing at some point with the town attorney, or maybe the council will be doing it on its own, is, is at some point saying that, that this, this is conditioned upon a certification from the, the license safety inspector. Uh, that the design has in fact been implemented to guarantee 100% shock containment. That's what you're saying? I said it about an hour ago. Okay. I just try to be... No, I'm just, I'm trying to keep it light too, because it's... Okay. But yes, basically that's what I made the motion that it would be a conditioned approval based on the sign-off of the designs of an NRA expert. Oh, Jamie, sorry. So my, my concern is that it's not the design alone that needs to be, it has to be the implementation of the design. So you can, we can have design today, but. Right, right well, that's what you know. Ben was, that's what in my motion, I said our code enforcement officer would, when it's built, like so. the occupancy, you know, permit that you get when you build a house, <clears throat> we'd have him go out and say, check, check, double check. They've implemented all of the design requirements they've, that's been submitted as the certified design. Right. Right. So the goal is to essentially say, with all the ones that we put contingencies on it, to say, once you do this, go to Ben, have them certify it, and then you can go ahead. Right. But it's a conditional license based on all those contingencies. Okay. The people understanding. Right. But it sounded like Michael added the other dimension of the certified uh, professional as well, that signed off on by the certified I, professional. The, you know, the, the council could do that, but you know, I, I think the council's direction needs to be the code enforcement officer. You know, I, I think if there's an understanding, you know, I, I just I can't speak for Ben, but you know, I would I would sense you'd want the certified guy to to give you some guidance. Yeah, I don't think he wants to be out there alone. Yeah. I think that's good practice. I think yeah. it makes sense. Well, as, as Michael said earlier, too, if Ben needs somebody, you know, right. he says to Mike, I'm going to go hire so-and-so because I need that expertise. Right. 
Mm -hmm. And just to be clear, all of the, the shooting, because it's all halted now, whether it be the 25 yards, 50 or 100, it would be staged based on these approvals through Ben. Nothing would open until to get all, all the... Mm -hmm. okay. They'd all have to be, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we... I thought I'd state the obvious. Mm -hmm. Jessica? Yep. And I'd, I'd like to ask uh, a question in a different way, but similar to Councilor Grennan's. So if we approved this this um, this license application with the essentially the two caveats because everything else has been unanimous so if we approved that tonight and again with the two caveats that we've listed here in our facts of findings of fact <clears throat> would there be any live fire tomorrow at the Sperlwick Road and Gun Club no. 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 When would the live fire occur in the future? Potentially. So what you said, we don't have the final draft, but once the code enforcement officer has signed off, then he's made the findings on 7, 9, and 13. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Other comments? No. Okay. So um, then. I'm sorry, Jim? I don't, I don't want to cut conversation off. No, no, go ahead. Do I make a motion to table this for our October meeting to bring this draft back to us in its final form? You can if you wish. Okay. One second. Just make sure the council's ready for that. I, well, that's the... Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that advice. That's why you said, do I make a that, that's, yeah. why, that's why I, I opened the said, door. I like you. I, no, I, you know, again, I don't want to cut the discussion off here, but at the same token, I think that it's pretty clear where, where we want to go. Yes. Caitlin. Yeah, okay. Before we go there, I'd just like to make sure we have one more thing wrapped up with a button, that the 50 and the 100 yard ranges that they've applied for in their application remain suspended. And we need to put some language in until, you know, similar designs are implemented. <clears throat> because my concern is if they want to come back in a year or two years and have implemented those designs, some people might argue that they are now expanding their use. And so I want to make sure that it is clear that that's just being temporarily suspended and we're going to continue to move forward in hopes that we can achieve the same things that we did for the 25 for those other range. Jim? Yeah, um, I guess uh, through you to the attorney, how does that, how do you memorialize that, that statement that Caitlin is concerned about? Is there a way to do that? Strange me. I think the motion to say it's only as to the 25 yards and the 50 and 100 yard remain suspended. Just to add that piece. Yeah. What, what happens after, mm -hmm. we don't have to state. You can state if it goes through reapplication or, or just a uh, certification um, mm -hmm. by the code enforcement officer at that time. I think it goes either one way, either one way or the other. If the town council approves mm -hmm. it at that time, or you delegate that if he makes those findings. But I, I'd be a little concerned with too much delegation um, on findings. But doesn't that become a new building permit for the 50 and the 100? Right. Hmm. So, it get, so the triggers, if you will, in terms of how the building permit is pulled with the necessary documentation and approvals, and then the measurement of the complete, completeness when it's done through Ben. So I, you know, I think if we add that, that line, I mean, I, I just want to make sure that what, what Caitlin is suggesting here is clear because there's been lots of conversation around expansion of use or change of use. And we want to make it clear that the 50 and 100 was on the table and has been. So. Michael and then Jamie. Jamie first. So just so I'm clear, the application for the license, was that based on the 25, the 50, and the 100? Right. So, yeah, then, then I think I agree with Caitlin that it should be for all of them, but contingent on Ben's finding that it's certified yeah. that it's yeah. in compliance with uh, mm -hmm. you know, our findings. 
Anyone else? Molly. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that we ought to be looking for certification on the expansion to the 50 and 100 and not require relicensing for that. I don't see that as an expansion of use. Um, I back on the conversation though about whether to table or not, and I I don't want to table because I don't want to end discussion. Uh, but I want to be very clear if we're voting tonight <coughs> what it is that we're voting on, and I know we've had a lot of discussion, and I thought that we were asking the town attorney to come back with a revision to the findings of fact. And I'm not insensitive, by the way, to the gun club situation either. I, I don't want to delay the process. It sounds to me like we're in agreement on where it is that we're headed, but in terms of dotted I's and cross T's, I'm not sure that we actually have the documentation to be able to take a vote. Which is what Dave would I just want to say, you know, it'd be nice to put this to bed this evening. You know, it's up to the council whether or not you table it. Usually, wordsmithing happens in the minutes, you know, afterward. In this instance, you know, this has gone on for decades. People are making big investments, both in homes and in, in improvements in, in the Rod and Gun Club. I, I really think you need to make sure you know what it is that you're, you're, you're passing, that the language is clear, and, you know, uh, I, I'd strongly encourage you to, to get the wordsmithing done. Uh, and vote on it at a subsequent meeting. That said, you know, this, this has been very, very stressful for people on both sides of the issue. Uh, you know, I think the testimony tonight that you heard on, on both sides of the issue. You know, I've listened to a lot of discussion. I think I know that, you know, if the word smithing turns out as, as we hear, I think I know how the council is going to vote. Uh, but, you know, I don't think it would hurt if, if councillors who chose to said a few words saying that, you know, if, if this turns out basically as we've gone through it, I'm inclined to vote yay or nay, just simply so that, you know, you'll still get a bunch of emails, but at, at the same time, you know, every, you know, people can make investments knowing what the outcome of this is, both the Rodden Gun Club and people looking at buying and selling houses, because a lot of people care very deeply about this. That's a good point, Mike. Thank you. Um, people want to say something? Yes, no? I'm seeing heads going back and forth. Yeah, sure. Jamie. Yeah, no, I'm, obviously I'm sympathetic to both sides in this, this issue, and I, <clears throat> and I appreciate the gun club's efforts to come into compliance with the ordinance. I know it's been burdensome. I appreciate the, the, uh, the residents who are abutters and the town's people who are concerned about the safety, and I think it's a legitimate safety concern, and it needs to be addressed. Um, I'm inclined to, I think you could tell from the way I was talking tonight, that I, I'm, I'm, I plan on voting, although I should make it clear that I will not be at next month's council meeting, so I will be absent for that vote. But uh, my support is um, that there be no resumption of live fire until there is shot containment certified. Um, I think everything else we've dealt with adequately tonight, but that that you not have live fire resumption <coughs> of any yards until there is certification of shot containment. Thank you. Who's next? Jim. Well, again, um, I've been imminently involved with this for a very long time, and um, I too feel that there's, there's been a lot of uh, conversation that has been less than pleasant over the last several years and uh, there's uh, people need to know where this is coming down I totally agree with Mike's position on that and um, you know I feel very strongly that uh, the gun club uh, was issued a hell of a wake-up call when they received Miss LaRose's report and uh, as far as I can gather um, they've approached it with uh, a a positive approach in, in trying to make it right. And for that, I, my hat's off to them. The, for all the members there who are uh, passionate about the sport and uh, for all the right reasons, um, you know, they've, uh, they've, they've dug in and they've done the things they needed to do. Um, I just wish that we had a completed project tonight. And my understanding is that they're only a little ways away from completing what they had started. So my hope is by October's meeting will have uh, we should have some results which I think would be good yeah. um, again I um, 
I too um, am uh, inclined to uh, to approve the license with the um, with what we've discussed tonight, with 100% shot containment as the goal. And when I asked Mr. Larose that question about this being an average club, how does it get to be a better than average club? He made it very clear from that podium, 100% containment, period. And that's where I come down on this. And only then can we actually say that we have a safe gun club. So that's where I come down. Next. Oh, yes, I'll go ahead. Um, yes, uh, Jim Walsh and I came on the council at the same time six years ago, and, and we have been studying this issue since then. And uh, the uh, safety, range safety evaluation by Mr. LaRosa certainly was uh, uh, surprising in some ways, very comprehensive, um, and um, definitely an eye opener. However, um, I think that um, the gun club is making good strides to comply. I think that all Cape Elizabeth citizens have a right to feel safe. And I also believe that the gun club has a right to exist. So how we put those together, I think, is critically important. And I think that um, 100% shock containment is the key because if there's 100% shock containment, there's 100% safety. And for those who have been complaining about noise for years, some that's their greatest issue, uh, we did learn that 100% shock, excuse me, shock containment will significantly help the noise issue. But for Maine statute, this is a grandfathered club pre-existing. We can't regulate noise. Um, I think that there's there's been, a, as we know, a great deal of, of uh, uh, concern, and it has been very unfortunate at times. I, I remember last year being very frustrated um, because the gun club's efforts to obtain funds from the state to actually build their No Blue Sky was, uh, there was a very concerted attempt to stop that grant. And um, for, uh, fortunately, it didn't ultimately stop. They did get that money but they've been trying to get this done. And so I am inclined to support this with the caveat of 100% shock containment. Thank you. Next. Sure. Caitlin? Well, I made you know, a you motion. You said anything tonight, so why don't you? <laughs> <laughs> My position is still the same from when we started that I made the motion, so. Okay, great. Patty. Sure. Um, I guess with this issue for me, I, I came upon it first as a citizen, um, watching it with when this all began. Um, I've been on the council a year and now have been following it through um, with the council. And what I feel is I feel like we've landed in a place of um, um, that made sure that I, I hear on both sides that safety is an issue. Whether you're in the gun club, safety to them is really important. Whether you're a neighbor um, in Cross Hill, safety is really important. I think that the um, the hiring of an independent um, NRA um, referred expert to conduct a safety evaluation is really the, 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 uh, the point that made this um, come to a point where we could uh, make sure that we have an ordinance that is going to be enforceable and something that is um, going to ensure that we have 100% um, shock containment. And that's really um, the biggest issue here. So I. Um, am inclined with, with all the conversations we had this evening to support um, and um, the licensing again as long as there is no resumption of live fire until we have complete 100 percent shot containment thank you Patty Molly I can't disagree with anything that anybody has said I only been on the council for less than two years we have been dealing with this really since my very first not even um, appearance on the council, but when I first came to a meeting to find out what the council actually did in town and found out that this was a very important issue. And I live at Elizabeth Farm, so I'm really across the street from the gun club. So I have some idea of, of the impact of the club on the community. Um, I have nothing but respect for the work that the folks at the gun club have done. 
Um, we had two emails today, one from Malcolm Weatherby, who commented on the fact that the club has been proactive and positive in implementing the requirements as set down by the Fire and Marines Committee. I agree. I, I really do appreciate the hard work that the club has done. He also was struck by Mark Woodward's email. He said the range supports important main traditions of self-sufficiency, safe use of firearms, and sporting activities. And we also heard that from the gentleman who spoke to us from South Portland tonight. Thank you. Um, I have nothing but respect for your work, and I really do appreciate all the work that the folks at the gun club have done and given 100% shot containment uh, as I, it has been made very clear tonight, I'm absolutely concerned with safety. And if we can accomplish that and we get the certification from the code enforcement officer, I will vote in favor of this. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Yeah. Um, I would probably echo what has been said tonight. Um, I've been dealing with the issue for four years, and um, I was um, chair of ordinance when we put this ordinance together, which was a um, a very difficult thing to do, and we've heard from people um, multiple times, people in this room that we've been hearing from since I know I began, <clears throat> and um, it's a tough issue. Um, people are concerned about safety. I understand that, and it, you know, as a counselor, I think that it's important that we um, make sure that safety is um, an utmost concern. Uh, people have a right to feel safe in their homes, on the street, uh, taking their dog for a walk. Um, and at the same time, we have a gun club that's been here um, almost as long as I have, and um, they have their rights too. Um, and they, um, I think they have stepped up to the plate. I think they have um, tried to do the things that they've been asked to do. Um, there's been a lot of hoops to jump through, and um, I think they've really tried very hard to do that. Um, I think we've got a few more, but um, my only real, not only real, but my biggest concern is for shot containment. And should we accomplish shot containment, then I will be inclined to uh, vote for um, the license that we have talked about this evening. So um, we have a motion and a second on the table. Does somebody want to um, make a motion? Michael? It's okay to cut off conversation. Okay. Up to the council. I, I move. Is I the move council that. okay to be cut off at this point? Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I move that we table this item uh, till our October 14th town council meeting. Thank you, Jim. Is there a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Molly. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay. Um, for those who think they're going to leave now, this is fine. Why don't we just take a three-minute break? And we do have a lot more work to do, so I'll give, if you could move yourself outside. Thank you.
Where did all the people go? <laughs> wow, I think it's going to be a lot cooler in this room now. <laughs> Okay, so we will be moving on to um, item 106, the report of the Solid Waste and Recycling Long Range Planning Committee. I hear, see that there's people here from that, so I will turn that over to Jessica. Thank you, Chairman Ray. Um, I'd like to introduce the members of the Solid Waste and Recycling Long Range Planning Committee. They are all here tonight, starting with Ann Swift-Kayata and Jamie Garvin, Chuck Wilson, Bill Brownell, and Bob Malley, our, our Public Works Director. Um, I'd like to just say a few words. Uh, and I'm going to read a couple things right from the summary. You all have uh, your copies of the report. Our committee worked for eight months and uh, did a lot of research. And I would like to say at the outset that mm. At the very least, this will be, I, fully, I believe, an outstanding research document for the town in the years to come. <clears throat> the committee took a hard look at safety, level of service, ease of use, and costs. Over eight months of extensive study and research, and while keeping both community desires and needs in mind, the committee's overall focus stayed on the following. How will residents be using the recycling center 25 to 30 years from now? What are the trends in municipal transfer station operation? What site designs and waste disposal methods will, will maximize safety and level of service? How can current community needs be met while also ensuring that the town plans for the future and an aging Cape Elizabeth demographic? And finally, how can the town minimize costs? You've all, I'm sure, had a chance to look through the document and to see the very, what we believe is a very exciting, very creative, and very cost-effective plan that we proposed. The majority of the design's costs relate to site work and alterations in traffic patterns. Not only will these changes best serve the town residents now and in the years to come, but they will also prove to be a more efficient use of taxpayer dollars. Importantly, going forward, the plan that we are proposing. The recycling and MSW outdoor compactor units will save over $50,000 each year in hauling fees. The proposed new design will result in a total annual cost of only $13,799 more than the current operation would cost after repairs that are required. So with that, very exciting statement, um, I would certainly field any questions. I know this, we're essentially um, hoping that you will officially receive the report tonight and perhaps uh, set a workshop for a later date. But I don't know if anyone has any brief questions for any of the committee members or for Bob Malley. Councilors have questions? Molly. I don't have questions. I just want to say I thought, as with so many, this is an incredibly impressive report. Thank you. Um, I did want to say I think that it was uh, particularly inclusive. I, I was really pleased that you looked at what I thought were the right goals, issues of citizen safety and ease of use, of course, but also um, certainly responsible to the taxpayer in terms of how much money we're going to spend. Um, and most importantly, I think that you looked at the right goal in terms of focusing on the long term. You're not looking for an immediate solution. We're looking at the next 25 or 30 years. We thought that was terrific. And the only other thing I wanted to say was how could there possibly be 90 signs in the existing site and how do we make it through there? That's a crazy number. Seriously. Yes, yeah, it's, it's sign pollution for sure. Yes. <laughs> so. But thank you. Well done. Thank you. Jim. Again, an incredible job. I mean, um, I, I'm extremely jealous about the committee that Jessica was, was uh, she assembled. I don't know whether there was a, you know, a, a player to be named later, but certainly this was quite, quite the group. And we thank you for your service to the town and, and really contributing to a long range plan that ultimately is going to serve citizens for years and years to come. Another item on tonight's agenda is our capital stewardship plan. And you'll be happy to know that there is a $1.4 million added to that plan, which is directly related to the report that you presented to us tonight, which is at least a, a statement that we're, uh, we're on board. But we need to know more, but we're on board, at least for the planning purposes anyway. So thank you. 
Jessica. I would, I would love to take credit for assembling this committee, <laughs> but the credit actually goes to the town council chairman. <laughs> Well, in that so, case, we need to talk, Kathy. <laughs> but, but, you know, if I, if I may, you know, we were particularly lucky because we have a committee made of, of ups, outstanding citizens who have all uh, given a great deal of their time and talent to the town. And so it was a delightful committee to work with. It was, everybody was engaged, productive, and played well in the sandbox together. So we actually had a good time. And I never knew there was so much about solid waste. <laughs> I never knew I would learn so much about it, but it really, uh, it really was, I think, an exceptional committee experience. And Jessica, didn't the committee also save enormous amounts of money by writing the report themselves? I'm so glad you asked. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is true. Um, the uh, engineering firm, Woodard and Current, whom, by the way, I neglected to mention, but they gave us tremendous support. Uh, and at the workshop, you'll meet Randy Tome and Megan McDevitt, who are the engineers that work with us. Uh, they actually assembled this for us, but, but we wrote it. Okay. Um, they provided uh, an engineering expertise, of course, but um, the committee wrote the report. And this saved, I think it was, Bob, was it about $35,000, I believe. And so as a result, that money was able to go into directly to engineering fees to help us gather the data and to study and do our analyses for this report. So it was a tremendous effort. Well, and the council deserves credit because they said I could appoint the committee members. So. <laughs> uh, well, good. Here we go. <laughs> Either that or you were asleep at the wheel when you're. Oh, well, hey. <laughs> Whatever. Great, thank you. Others? Yes? No? Um, I just want to say thank you so much. You folks did a phenomenal job. I mean, when I saw the report, I, I couldn't believe in such a short period of time that you came up with all that information. I mean, it was amazing. And I've read it once, but I'm thinking I've got to read it again and again because there's just so much you, to redigest. Um, so anyway, thank you so much. Um, I, um, Chairman Ray, yes. may I say one more thing? Certainly. <laughs> um, I would also like to especially thank Bob Malley, our Public Works Director, who gave us incredible support all the time with all kinds of research, um, what has been done in the past, um, and as a tremendous resource, having been our Public director, Works Director for so many years, knew where to, direct, where to send us for information and where to help us go get information that we needed to make a lot of our decisions. And also to Anne swift Kayata because she was our editor-in-chief, <laughs> and uh, which was quite a task. And so uh, they both deserve special mention. So thank you. Thank you. Jessica, do you want to uh, make a motion to, uh, to um, receive the report? I will. <coughs> I move that the Town Council received the report of the Solid Waste and Recycling Long Range Planning Committee. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Jamie, thank you. Any other discussion? Are you going so to I think the workshop, and this will be October 19th, will be sending out a confirming email. So, so is that another meeting, or is that part of the 14 that I'm? That's on the list already. <laughs> good. Okay. Good. On the list. Well, it's on the list. Was, you know, I. Yeah. I've, I've been joking that I have 14 more meetings uh, to go to, but every time I turn around, Molly's adding another meeting, you know, so. I tried not to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anything else to be said? No? All in favor? Thank you so much again. Thank you. Wonderful job. You. Okay. <laughs> doze off, Chuck, here a minute. I don't know if you sta stayed here through all of the last. I mean, were you here the whole time? Oh, there you oh. go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. See ya. Okay, then we will move on to uh, item 10, item 103, uh, proposed lease agreement of space at office building at the front of the community center. Jamie is recusing himself. Um, are, is everyone all right with that? Yep. Sure. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, and before we... Uh, proceed with that. Um, it was tabled the last time and it needs to be taken off the table. So um, if we are going to discuss it this, this evening, I need a motion to take this item off the table. Caitlin. I move that we take the proposed lease agreement 
for the space at office building at front of community center off the table. Thank you. Is there a second? Jim? Seconded. Okay. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Okay. It's off the table. <coughs> All right. Caitlin? I move that we uh, grant the town manager uh, permission to sign the new lease agreement for the next three years until July 31st, 2018 at 343 Ocean House Road for the law offices of Wagner Law. Okay, and is there a second? I'll Jim? second it. All right, great. Um, discussion, Michael. Yeah, I just want to briefly explain. I want to first thank uh, Greg Miles and Tom Leahy uh, for some improvements to this working working uh, with the tenant uh, over the last uh, month. The uh, one of the things you know we, when we looked at the, the lease form last time, we weren't really happy with the template. At least I wasn't happy with the template. And Tom provided a, a new template that then Greg took uh, and added the specific terms with it, working with Jamie. And uh, you know I, I think now we have a much better template. Uh, that we'll be using for all of our for all of our commercial leases, and just add adding the term. You know, I, I know there's been some other you know uh, concerns with some of the lease payments. We gave you the the list of that. The lease payments now up to date. You know, I I am recommending that you you authorize me to sign this. Uh, you know, it's uh, you know it's a very awkward building, and you've got to have the right tenants and, and the right mix. You know, for example, Edward Jones has a provision that you can't have anyone there that has a financial advisory capacity. It, it, so, and you know, so it's it's limited what you can lease it to. You know, there there are other people that can lease, but you know, we have a tenant who is going to set up automatic payments, uh, who uh, you know has hasn't been a problem with any other tenant. Uh, you know, it's you know it, this is awkward. You know, you know Jamie's not running for election, so I feel more at liberty to to talk than whatever. And you know, but it, to me, you know, I understand this concerns, but I, I you know, to me, there, there's revenue that's to commit every month. I think that's important, and the tenant is compatible with the other tenants. And uh, I would encourage the council to authorize me to sign it. Thank you. I forgot to ask before if anybody wanted to speak to this issue from the public. Okay. All right. Thank you, Michael. Comments? Anybody? No? No? Jessica? Yeah, I, I, I've had a hard time with this um, because <coughs> of the history that goes back to July 2012. Um, and it's really regrettable we're in this position. I think that um, it's a very difficult one for a variety of reasons, but I would like to point out that we, we demand that our citizens pay their property taxes on time so that the town can collect its revenue and that both the town and school department can pay their bills, pay employees, and provide services. I think that elected officials should make, meet the same, meet or exceed the same standards. So I, I, although I recognize the town manager is recommending that we, we approve this, I in good conscience cannot support the, this request for a new lease based on the long history of late payments. Anyone else? Oh, Molly. Um, I understand what you're saying, Jessica. I don't have that particular issue, but, but I do understand the concern. M my concern actually lies on the other side of the equation that I want to make sure that the town and its employees are diligent in pursuing a remedy if we end up in that position again in the future. That's all. And other than that, I'm in favor of moving ahead with this. Jim. Again, I understand the position that, uh, that Jessica has expressed here. I did read the lease. Um, thank you for, for cleaning that up. I think it's a much better product in a lot of ways. I just had a couple of questions about the lease, and one was the uh, security deposit is only $250, yet the rent is 500 a month. I'm just curious if there was any reason why it didn't equal one month's rent, just you know, as a matter of, uh, of uh, practice uh, standard, if you will. And the second is, you know, with the concern that has been verbalized here, um, I understand 
is a 3% late charge if one is late. And I wonder if that's sufficient when you're considering, you know, trying to move this to an on-time payment. Just a couple of questions. I know that the lease is in, in, uh, in our packet today, but, um, but those were two questions I had. Um, you know, when I have tenants that are late, we, I tend to have a, a much higher late fee. Um, than what is implied in this particular lease. So, again, I'm not making any recommendations, but just my observations. I, I think Greg provides some background on the security deposit. And, you know, in, you know ultimately, you did, the council determines the terms of a lease. So, if you want a different percentage, you know, I suppose that could be an amendment, and then we go back and negotiate with the prospective mm -hmm. tenant. That's what yeah. comes. Do, do, do you have any information on the security deposit through the chair? Certainly. Currently, we have a security deposit for the existing space. Uh, this would be an additional 250, which would bring it up to one month, equi uh, equal to one month or $500. And it, does, it doesn't read that way, but whatever. Uh, if it's 500, that's great. It's all. It, it just seemed odd to be less than the monthly rent. That's all. Well, he already has 250 on. I figured he had 250 yes. on account. Yep. But Thank you. I had a question maybe for either Mike or Greg. Um, the lease is with Asylum Law L3C, um, which, if I'm understanding it correctly, is its own entity. Um, so the lease is not actually with uh, Mr. Wagner. It's with um, his um, L3C. Uh, and I'm wondering, um, you know, I'm hearing people saying that they're going to approve this, but I wonder if we should be looking at um, a personal guarantee? I think you know, that's more a question for the town attorney. Uh, I actually, I did look up L3Cs and I see they were established in 2009. Mm. And I haven't had one yet. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, but it's an entity, so um, if that's, I thought that was one area of um, ambiguity, who the tenant was. Because in the last page of the signature block, it has both. So I think the question for the council, as a, you know, you're in charge of this issue, is do you want Mr. Wagner to sign or do you accept his entity, his um, asylum entity? That's an either or. Or you could personally guarantee it. I mean, you want him as a personal obligor. The issue on, this, on the security deposit um, in response to uh, Councilor Walsh, uh, definitely Mike can make that clear, that it's an additional 250 Deposit. Yeah. I didn't, again, I didn't see this final draft until today. If you could, that's all. He needs that, to get, that could be clarified with us. Well, he needs to have, have it on credit. I mean, if he's entitled to his 500 when he gets out of there three years from now or whatever. It's, it's Correct. It should be clarified just yeah. by, Thank that's you. an additional 250 to what's been attained. Yeah. Councilors? Molly. Did we put any money into the space? Currently? Did we put any money into a fit up? No, no. We're going to be doing some renovations, or up, I shouldn't say renovations, some regular maintenance to the facility. To the uh, building as a whole, but yeah. to the <coughs> Correct. premises. Yeah. No, we're going to paint it, which we've done for any of our tenants that we move in, that move into our uh, facilities prior to. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we got a few rotting sills, you know. We, we're doing some routine stuff that needs to be done anyway. There's, there's no, we're not doing a, you know, changing configuration of offices or the, the typical. Right. Uh, you know, tenant fit up. All we're doing is, is really routine maintenance of stuff that ought to be addressed anyway. I'm less concerned about either the security deposit or the uh, lease guarantee, given that we haven't, we, the community, the town hasn't put money into the building other than the base building, which is the landlord's responsibility typically anyway. If if we had tenant fit up dollars in there, I'd be much more concerned about having the lease guarantee. Anyone else? No. Um, I'll uh, weigh in. Um, I'm uh, where Jessica is. I'm going to, um, although I know I'll be outvoted, I'm going to vote against this motion. Um, I spent many years in credit and collections, and I am not pleased with the late payments. Um, and I believe that past behavior is an indication of, of future behavior. So um, I am disappointed that we're in this position. Um, I would have liked to have been, had this be just a very uh, vanilla um, new lease, like with our other tenants who are up to date. 
So um, I will be voting against it. Um, any other comments? No? All in favor of the motion? All opposed? Okay. Motion passes. All right. Um, item 107. Ordinance Committee Report on Proposed Land Use Amendments and Updated Sewer Service Area Map and Transfer of Developed Rights Map. Um, can, you, can you give us an update or maybe an uh, overview of the changes or the proposals? All right, where are we on? Sorry. Oh. Okay. No, no, no. I, I, the, the wrong date was on the agenda, and I was just pointing that out. Oh, it's my okay. mistake. I was pointing that oh, out. Oh, no, that's all right. Thank you, Tom. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, um, I, I guess I missed it. No, that's all right. Um, did you want to um, update us on the Ordinance Committee's report on the proposed land use amendments and updated sewer service area map and transfer of development rights map and maybe just give us uh, the highlights of changes or, or what things that we should know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got to open the... Uh, yep, sure. Okay. Yeah. At our last, um, I believe it was our August, our August 2015 Ordinance Committee meeting, we um, finalized our review of the amendment package and the, I think we heard the community comments and implemented them uh, appropriately. Uh, the most, the ones that kind of got the most, uh, that we received the most feedback on were regarding the size of the acreage for multiplex housing. Um, so we decided that, uh, or at least it's our recommendation to the council, that we reduce the minimum, uh, that we remove uh, the proposal that uh, to reduce the minimum lot size in the RA district from 10 acres to 5 acres. So we've deleted that. At least that's our proposal. Mm -hmm. um, with the RC district, uh, there was a recommendation to reduce um, the minimum acreage from 5 acres to 3 acres, and we suggest that we delete that and keep it the same. Uh, we, we didn't hear anything from the town that was screaming out for um, a reduction in acreage size for multiplex housing. Mm -hmm. um, there was a couple other minor uh, changes regarding setbacks. Um, uh, we talked about incre the, the wording as the planning board had it was increasing or changing, and we deleted those. So we've allowed the ability to modify setbacks. Um, added a reference to the Greenbelt Trail to make clear of the, uh, the public access connectors. Um, we added some text to make clear that it's the front of the building that must be oriented to the right of way. Um, we've clarified the exterior siding paragraph, and we've deleted um, the prohibition of vinyl siding. So we suggest that we permit vinyl siding. Um, this one received a lot of comment from the public was the, the height of the building. Um, the planning board proposed going up to 50 feet in height and we've uh, proposed deletion of that as well. Um, and then finally, the text has some clarification regarding the restriction of the maximum bonus to be no more than 30% of the base density. Given the late hour, I think I'll uh, wrap it up at that and recommend uh, approval, um, or at least that's a recommendation of the Ordinance Committee to the Council now. Now, I think our agenda mentions um, sending this to a workshop or setting a public hearing. Um, does the um, Ordinance Committee have a proposal, a motion? Yeah, I believe he said that we uh, want to refer this to a workshop um, for October 14th, was it, Mike? That's the Council meeting. Oh. If you want a public hearing, it'd be the October 14th. Otherwise, you just generally... I, I, I guess I'd defer to the will of the council whether or not they think it's necessary to have a workshop on, on the issue. Uh, I don't know Probably that not. the ordinance committee didn't feel that it was necessary. Oh. So then we should we'll send it to a public, public hearing? hearing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can we do that, Mike? 
if you'd like. Um, <laughs> Jamie, do you want to uh, make a motion to, yeah, to public Yeah, move that we um, send the um, proposed land use amendments for uh, public hearing on October 14th. It says so October 16th. Mike told me that was, that was wrong. It's the Wednesday night. It's the 14th. It's the 14th. 14th. Yeah. 14th. So it was wrong on the agenda. It was wrong on the agenda. Okay, yeah. thank you. And this also would include the public hearing as well on the two maps, which needs to be Correct. part of it. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Caitlin, thank you. I've been reminded 10 times. Any, any, any discussion? No? All in favor? Okay. Uh, capital stewardship plan, item 108. Mike. Yeah, we had a workshop on this the other day. It, it outlines for the next 10 years different capital improvements, priorities. Uh, again, it's only recommendations. You only acknowledge your receipt of it. You're not taking action on it. And approval of any specific items would come about as a result of future budgets and council decisions. So I ask that you acknowledge receipt of it. Okay, is there a motion to do so? If anyone present wants copies, we, we have paper copies. Jim. I move that we accept uh, the capital stewardship plan as uh, described in today's packet. Are we acknowledging receipt of that, Jim? Mm -hmm. Yes. Not accepting, but acknowledging. Oh, it, okay. I would, then I amend my motion to, uh, to the, accept or receipt of the capital stewardship plan as it is described in today's packet. Thank you. Is there a second? Jessica? I second. Thank you. Discussion? Yes. Yes, sorry. Could, uh, could, I, could I ask through you the town manager to clarify an item on that, on that capital stewardship plan with regard to the tractor trailer? Je Which one? Oh, the, tra the tractor hauling Oh, yeah, trailer. That, that wouldn't be purchased. If, if, right, if. but, but counselors having reviewed the uh, solid waste um, report may may wonder about that in the capital stewardship plan. So if you could just, yeah. it's just a typo essentially, but. Yeah, well, there was no, yeah, if the, the plan goes forward as being recommended by the committee that just made the report, we would no longer need to, to buy those transfer trailers. That's right, and, and you will see it on, in one of those capital stewardship plans. It's on, I think it's in the 10 year plan for $125,000. But again, should, should the council approve the committee's report and implement it, that that item is not there. Not necessary. Because the plan involves uh, contracting, all hauling. M much of it is hauled now anyway by an independent contractor. So, yeah. Thank right. you for that clarification. Mike, isn't, isn't everything though on this as we go forward, it's kind of, the, they're all placeholders and as things change and things happen, they come in or they come out. Yeah. Yeah, so. We update it every year. You update it every year. Yeah, so. Yeah, may I? Yes. But I, ju I just wanted, in case someone saw that and went back and cross-referenced to the report, they'd think, well, wait a minute, what is this? But yes, there are items in the, excuse me, <clears throat> items in there that I noticed that we haven't approved yet. Right. Because they're essentially placeholders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so that's a good point. I'm glad you pointed that out. Because there's other placeholders in there as well. Yeah. Um, that, you know. Like the bleachers at Fort Williams. Yes. Uh, you know, I think if you look at the plan, you, other than what's listed for FY 2016, you haven't approved anything. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Great. Um, so uh, we we had a motion and a second. So um, all in favor? I hope I didn't do that twice. Okay. Great. Um, draft personnel code amendments, Michael, item 109. Yeah, uh, these amendments were actually drafted by Rick Dacry, who has been working with us as, as an HR consultant. Uh, they, they deal with issues of firearms, proper dress, safety and health, accidents and injuries, modified duty, and it updates so that we're in compliance with uh, the, the Obamacare, what do they call it, the Affordable Care Act? Yeah, yep. Obamacare. Mm -hmm. uh, they provisions to make sure we're in conformance with that, with health insurance coverage during leaves of absence of COBRA. You know, uh, I, I should say that what, what you're uh, being asked to do is to approve these amendments, but I would like to point out in, in the draft that you got, we actually didn't catch, between when he did this draft, we actually had another amendment involving health insurance buyouts that will be in, when, when this is codified, that will also be included in this has already been adopted by the council. So, 
One of our public works uh, employees, Todd, discovered that today. Thank you, Todd. Oh, great. Okay, so um, you all have a copy of that, and I'm sure that you had a chance to look it over. So is there a motion to e approve um, the draft amendments to the personnel code? Jessica? I so move. Thank you. Is there a second? Patty? I'll second. Oops. Patty, there are, yep, okay. yeah. Questions? Caitlin. I just had a question about the political activity. Is that, I mean, because I've got red. You know what page you're referencing? So it's can... section 3112. 3112. Thank you. Um, what, I guess, because I didn't have a draft of it before, there's red words being added. I see regular is added a lot. And then there's bolded stuff, and then there's bolded underline. Are we adding bolded underline? Is it just bolded and underlined? In 3112? It says political activity. Is there something underlined in your copy? Yeah, it's all, yeah, it's all yeah. underlined yeah. in this copy. I'm, oh, that's already in the current. Uh, oh, that's no. in the current personnel code. Okay, so then can I ask a question about that? Wasn't there just a case down in South Portland about not being able to refrain employees from seeking um, election and nomination that once they became elected that they might have to step yeah. down from employment? But I'm just, I, I just thought that might be an issue. I don't want to refrain employees from being able to seek election if that's what they choose, but I understand we have a provision that you can't be employed and be a town councillor, but that would be their choice to have to step down from their job to have this wonderful non-paying job. But I just was, I remember that happening down in South Portland, I believe it was South Portland, that it was back and forth that you have to allow them to at least run. Yeah, we, we had that case when John McGinty ran for the town council. Uh, he was a police officer at the time. He was he was allowed to run for the town council, but once he was elected, you know, he had to he stepped down from the police department. Right, but as this is worded, it says while working for the town, all employees shall refrain from seeking or accepting nomination or election no, to any elected. No, we'll take a look at it. it uh, We'll take a look at it. Yeah, there's lots of you know that was a, that was the the Callahan case, mm -hmm. I think in South Portland. Mm -hmm. School school can't school board one that one. I don't remember what it, I just. We'll take a look at it. Yeah. You know, it, 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 you know the whole the, the, the gist of it is, is is you don't want employees getting into real difficult situations where they get so heavily involved in the politics of the council that then they support the wrong group of candidates. And then there's retribution, you know, and then there's all sorts of allegations. This happened because I supported hmm. blank over blank. And, you know, they, they, but, you know, they all have rights. They have First Amendment rights to speak out. Uh, they can, you know, do all sorts of things. And, you know, in this language has been in place essentially with a couple of minor amendments since the 1960s, I think. Uh, and, you know, the first time we've had a personnel code. Uh, so, you know, it, it probably needs looking, it probably needs looking at. Okay. But it's interesting enough, it's not one that our consultant, we had a look at the whole thing, it's not one he picked up for change. Other questions? No, nobody else has any other questions? Okay, so there is a motion on the table. Um, I'm just saying that, Caitlin, I don't... Just for the amendments, I mean, we're, yeah, we can, I'm just asking we take a look at maybe... Yeah this section for another amendment I'll okay. come later. You're, you're ready to approve this. You just want us to come back after looking yeah. at that section. Yeah, we'll, we'll look at it. Come back. I just wanted to be sure. Yeah, okay. All right, so all in favor? All right, everybody, great. Um, item 110, updated agreement with Opportunity Alliance for General Assistance Program. Michael. Yeah, yeah, I'm not, you know, a lot of these administrative type agreements, you know, I'm not sure they need to keep coming back to you. But I think it's nice to come back to you every so often so you're aware of it. Uh, you know, I think this has been renewed a few times. We haven't brought it back to you. But anyway, this, you originally had approved an agreement with CROP that then merged with the Opportunity Alliance. And what this is is Deborah works very closely uh, with a social worker from the Opportunity Alliance. And they meet all our general assistance clients. They determine eligibility and, you know, also advise on, on uh, opportunities that individuals have uh, for assistance, and uh, you know, we contract out the service because 
you know, we just don't have enough business to keep up on all the laws and all the, the, the various services. But Deborah works very closely with this. Anything you want to add, Deborah? Uh, no, other than we just couldn't do it without, um, as Michael said, with the, the laws changing as they do and resources needed. We, we actually get some very interesting and complicated cases, even in our small community, and have to reach out to other resources that uh, we wouldn't necessarily be aware of. So it's incredibly helpful to have a, a social worker that works with other communities on a broader scale to know what's available to uh, our residents as well. So we really couldn't do it without them. And this is like um, when we have tax um, abatement requests. These are some of the people that oftentimes you go to for help with some of these folks. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Um, is there a motion to um, approve the updated agreement with Opportunity Alliance? Patty. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Jessica. Second. Thank you. Any co comments, questions? All in favor? I'll go as quickly as I can. <laughs> Item 111, sewer user charge collection agreement update. Michael. Yeah, the Pullet Water District wants to update our agreement for uh, their collection of sewer fees on our behalf. Uh, the only primary change in this is the manner in which someone would actually get a submeter. And right now they go to the Water District. Instead, they would go to Public Works or do it online with Public Works. And then the Water District would email, would email, would actually send by UPS a a, post, a new submeter to them. It seems an odd way to do it, but it's what they propose to go all the different communities. Hmm. And how does the person install it? You still have to get a plumber to do it. I see. Okay. Yeah. But in, so I, I think security and other reasons they don't want to. My, my sense is if you go to the, it's like an armed fortress to get into the water district now. And I think they'd much prefer to, to mail stuff to people rather than have security risk. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the um, updated agreement uh, with Portland Water District? Jessica. I'll so move. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll Molly. Second that. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> Sorry, we're all Getting asleep here. I know. Um, any questions, comments? All in favor? Great. Item 112, loan agreement for second order Fresno lens. Mike. Yeah, this is a beautiful lens we have down at the Museum at Portland Headlight. Uh, they, would, they have a, an agreement with the Mystic Seaport Museum. The Mystic Seaport Museum still owns it. We provide insurance for it. And we also, you know, have to keep it and maintain it in good order. Is there any change to We this? do not pay them any fees. Oh. Uh, no, just updating the dates. Okay, great. Is there a motion to accept? Molly. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Addie? Oops, sorry. sorry. Um, questions? Comments? All in favor? Item 113, Main Incorporation of Museum at Portland Headlight. Mike. Yeah, every year you need to file, we, we, we file a 990 with the feds, the IRS for the, Portland, <coughs> for the Museum at Portland Headlight. You also need to continue updating the Main Bureau of Corporation and Elections, whatever they call themselves. Uh, and we, we recently, we, we had an insurance issue about the insurance for the, the, the lighthouse and everything uh, with our risk pool insurance. And MMA risk pool actually checked with the Secretary of State's office and found out that our, ex, our incorporation had expired. So we need to Oops. sign the forms again and apply for a new one. It doesn't affect, you know, anything other than, you know, compliance with filing requirements, I think, I, you know. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the new incorporation? The signature page is almost dead. Jim. Are you looking for? Yes, please. I'm so moved. I, I would move that we accept that. Okay, thank you. Um, is there a second? Second. Molly. Second. Thank you. I should have gone to Jamie this time. Um, Just Question, yes. Yeah, qu uh, question, um, Michael. What, um, I mean, if, if we're not incorporated, yeah. okay, and we had a problem, yeah. would there be no insurance because of that? You know, it, well, they, they, I don't know. They got a new auditor or something at MMA, a new underwriter. Yeah. And, you know, they, they tried to get us to, they were trying to get us to buy new insurance for the yeah. lighthouse that was separate and apart from the town insurance. Okay. And, you know, so then they, they had us looking back in the records of 1991 and two. Did the town council ever authorize 
the incorporation. You know, we found it in the minutes that you did. So but then, they, then they went and they did this online check with the state and said, oh, by the way, it's expired. So that's why this is before you. It, but it all has to do with, with looking for more affordable insurance, plus the fact we need to be compliant with the registration requirement. It's not at all unusual that there are a lot of not-for-profits that haven't done their filing, but, you know, yeah. we'll put in a particular file to make sure it gets done every year. I mean, it, it, my LLCs and things like that, all um, they all come automatically to me to remind me. Yeah, the state does File the annual report and do all that good stuff. Yeah, I, apparently. I just, I just worry about the legality of having a loss and then finding ourselves because yeah. we're not incorporated we're liable at a different <laughs> level than we would otherwise that's all you know we, so that, i don't know well it sounds like you're going to have to button it up a bit and that's that's yeah. okay good well the good the good news is as soon as we get it filed it, there won't be questions yeah okay yeah other questions comments no um all in favor Okay, and last item, item 114, the warrant for the November 3rd, 2015 municipal election. Deborah, you want to give us a... Sure, I'd be happy to. This calls for the municipal election warrant on Tuesday, November 3rd. Residents will be voting on three members of town council and school board, all for three-year terms. Also, there's one of our two members that we share with South Portland on the Portland Water District trustees, uh, and that is a five-year term. Uh, the election will be held at the high school gymnasium, uh, polling hours 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. The warrant is uh, in order for council signatures this evening. And the um, um, absentee it starts approximately 30 days? Yeah, approximately October 5th. Uh, we'll have that certainly on the website when that, that begins along with uh, copies of the specimen ballots and so forth. Okay, great. Is there a motion to approve the warrant? I so move. Jessica, thank you. Is there a second? Patty, thank you. <laughs> Any discussion? No. No. All in favor? Is there a motion to adjourn? Citizen comment. Citizen comment. I'm so sorry. And there's two citizens in the room. I was getting, I was jumping the gun. Does anybody want to make any comments? No. Okay. Thank you for the reminder. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you, Seconded. Molly. Thank you, Jim. Any discussion? <laughs> All in favor. There needs to be any discussion. Right. And we made it out before 10.30. Thank you. The Thomas Jordan Grants Committee has a very brief meeting. Very brief. Signatures to get.